Okay, we're back in regular session. We had started the meeting with, uh, with an executive session. We're back in regular session. Um, we've already called the roll and all council members are here, uh, as is Kent Bristol, our uh, interim village manager, and uh, Judy Kittner, our clerk. And um, the first item on the agenda. Pardon? Hmm? Well, I came in late, so. Oh, I'm sorry, Jerry. Yeah, Jerry, Jerry's here too. Um, first uh, um, item on the agenda under announcements is um, to hear from um, Mark Roosevelt, who's the Antioch College uh, president. Mr. Roosevelt. Do I come to the Yes, you do. Please do. my first time in front of you. Thank you. It's the first time. I've been underdressed for a Yellow Springs event for which I apologize <laughs> and actually I'm probably having a rather serious identity crisis because of it. Um, I was asked just to come and give an update on the college and uh, where we are and I thank you for that invitation. I thank you for the courtesy of letting me go first so I can put my seven-year-old to bed. Um, first of all, um, you know, just in terms of our work with the village, we are hugely grateful on um, the signs that are all over the village now welcoming the first class and heralding Antioch College are kind of a, a metaphor for us of our relationship with the village which is sweet they were put up for the accreditation visit so if I have to look back now and just do a summary of where we are um, I've been here three years I think when the people assembled on the lawn of the college to raise the keys and toast the independence of Antioch College again there were three significant threats to the college's future. There were more, but three that you can lump. One was accreditation. Um, when you close a college, you automatically lose accreditation. Um, the process of winning back accreditation is extremely um, comprehensive and challenging, and we have made very good progress in that. We will hear soon whether we'll be what's called a candidate for accreditation, which is our first official status with that body and that would entitle us to federal financial aid for our students work study money etc be a, a very significant moment for the college we had our site visit in November it went very well but I can't really talk much about it until the Higher Learning Commission actually votes which won't be until June there's an intermediary step when we go to Chicago uh, in April to talk to the IAC which is the intermediary body um, but nothing really becomes public until the June visit. The second threat, if you will, or great challenge was could the college without accreditation and with a very um, um, minimal physical plant attract quality students to the college and that that was a huge challenge and as you know, or as you may know, I'm sorry to assume anything, the Board of Trustees voted to have a full scholarship offering because our our research showed that without that, uh, we would not succeed, that without accreditation, with a very thin course catalog, and with a campus that really didn't offer much more than a dorm room and a classroom, it just wasn't going to work. That's probably the college's biggest success story in the past three years. We have had uh, accepted on average about 15% of our applicants. Um, we rank right at the top of the second tier if you do that in terms of five tiers of American colleges in terms of selectivity. So that's a pretty good story, a substantial success for the college. The third challenge, of course, is the big challenge, and that is money. Um, that's still the challenge that confronts us in the most onerous way. Um, there were some, um, to be very honest with you, misestimations of this challenge primarily based on the early and rather inaccurate assessments of how much it would cost to bring the physical plan of the college back to a acceptable state. Um, those of us that are old enough, and I'm not going to make any assumptions, we were sometimes assigned Eric Hoffer when we were in school, the philosopher, the longshoreman philosopher, who said that deferred maintenance was the surest sign of a declining civilization. Deferred maintenance was the story on the campus for 30 <coughs> plus years. So no building is ADA accessible. No building is in any way prepared for the 21st century. When I was hired, the sum put on renovating the campus was $30 million. It was off by more than one, by two thirds. It's $100 million plus. That's our challenge. 
We've been enormously successful with raising money in terms of participation rates and in terms of giving percentages. The college at its low point was getting less than 4% of alumni to contribute to it. We're now up close to 30%. That's a huge success. But again, being very honest with you, we lack the gifts at the top of a giving pyramid. So we need to develop people who can give us the $15 million, the $10 million gifts to get to $100 million. Without that is almost impossible. So our giving pyramid includes $32 million of gifts at the top. If you think about that, that's $650,000, $50,000 gifts if you wanted to attempt to compensate for it. That's the challenge we face. It's a challenge that we are aware of, we've been aware of for a time, but it's still there. We've raised $53 million since closure. Last year was by far the most successful year in the history of the college. We raised about $19.5 million. Um, it's a tremendous story, it's wonderful, but it has to continue for the next few years. That's a very daunting challenge. Um, ties with the village. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. We think a lot about this. We, we talk a lot about it internally. It's just there, and you don't even think about how substantial it is until you analyze each and every one of them. The Glen probably is the largest in terms of shared usage. And uh, I do want to say thank you, of course, to the village for the contribution that has helped place the Glen into protection for perpetuity, um, but also to, to think about what the Board of Trustees chose to do with that, because it's our most substantial resource. And it's been a goal, Nick Budis tells me, for 90 years to place the Glen into protection. And it's on the cusp of being accomplished. So that's a huge victory for the village, for the college, for everybody in terms of open space, over a thousand acres that would be guaranteed in perpetuity to be protected. But you know, there's the chapel, there's the gallery, there's, in my case, the tennis courts, there's the riding center. Um, there's all kinds of events, Martin Luther King Day, etc. But I think that we're just at the beginning of making this deeper. When the Wellness Center opens in June, that will be a huge shared resource between the college and the village. And if those of you who have not had tours, please come and do so. It's going to be beautiful. Beautiful in that it's an old building and it retains much of the beauty of that old building, but it's also going to be a modern, clean, wonderful facility. So as we do that, and we've hired a director of the center, this will be in some ways challenging, of course, because we have to work out the finances of it and how to do this in such a way that over time it moves towards being a break-even center. But it's going to be a huge asset for the village that we'll all, I think, wonder what it was like before we had it. Uh, the theater also, um, which the community has been very supportive of, will be reopening as a joint village college resource. We're small, the village is small, it just makes sense for us to be looking to ways to share facilities and resources in this manner. As I think about the future, uh, I think there are all kinds of other ways that we might work together. Our uh, food center at the college, which is serving almost <coughs> all locally sourced food, some from our own farm, all else from local farmers. Their dream down the road is to work with the public schools in town and to perhaps be the food provider for the public schools, which would be a huge benefit to the schools and the quality of the food and the nutritional value of the food that is served. That's just one example. The college now employs 118 people. So there are 90 staff there and 28 faculty. We're going to do upwards of $80 million of renovation. Uh, if you talk to the workers there, it's really quite wonderful. They're spectacularly grateful for the employment and the jobs um, that this will bring, that this is bringing. Uh, we have not um, been mistake free. Um, we are moving fast. The, the tension for us is in order to be a sustainable financial entity, and that's Antioch College's big challenge, we have to get the college renovated to the point that when we get accreditation, and again, if all things go well, that will be June of 2016 in a best case scenario, that the college has been renovated to a point where we have the basic amenities <coughs> to offer students that we can successfully charge tuition. 
starting in 2015, we're going to move away from the full scholarship to a half scholarship. That's a very important point for us. Can we succeed in attracting quality students to the college without the full scholarship offer that has been such a boon to us? There's time pressure on us. Um, we are um, blessed with the windfall that we received when YSI was purchased and the check that came to the college, but those monies only go so far and the fundraising. So there's this tension, this time tension between raising the money, getting the renovations done, um, and, and achieving accreditation in a timely manner that can help kick in and reduce the college's fundraising needs for operating funds uh, going forward. Partly as a result of this, and I don't mean to be making excuses, our communication has been imperfect, and we know that. And we will work to improve that um, with neighbors and with others about what the college is doing. So that's my update. I was given 10 minutes. It's the first time in my life I've actually succeeded at coming in <laughs> underneath <laughs> that. So absent the tie, I kept the time requirement, which you probably preferred. <laughs> and I don't know if it is well, so good for questions. Council has qu any questions from our council? Yeah. Yes. Um, in terms of communication, is there someone or an entity at the college that could be sending out periodic reports to the village um, and vice versa that the village government could contact uh, for sure. to give information or to receive information? Dan Doran, who is three weeks old. Well, I take that back. <laughs> He's four weeks with the college. He's older in, in terms of his lifespan. <laughs> he's our new communications director. Uh, and Andy Atkins, that? who you know is a villager, who's our, our new secretary of, uh, secretary of Administration and Finance. I'm making it sound yeah. like the presidential administration, vice president of administration and finance. Um, Andy's been working with taking over in terms of village communications, in terms of some of the issues around the golf course. Dan is the general point of contact for, um, for us. So we, will, we would love to do regular communication or whatever suits you it, best. And to, to follow up on that, when, when you communicate with us, you're essentially communicating with the village. I mean, that is really the most, um, the truest way to, to be communicating with the village. Um, oh, I like that. So if we communicate with you, we can yeah. just stop it's, right it's there. It's all public it record. Public record, and, okay. right. and, and we, you know, we'd like to invite you back. I mean, certainly every year, uh, certainly a report every year. It's hard to believe it's been three years. And I will wear a tie next time. invited you earlier. So. And I will take 15 minutes. Any other questions from <laughs> other council members? <laughs> Kent? Nothing. This is Yellow Springs. You can't just have one question. <laughs> <laughs> There's a city ordinance, I was turn told, a town ordinance. Yeah. I can't turn around right now. <laughs> 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 My body only goes one way. <laughs> <laughs> I will not. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And, and please know, we really, and I mean this, it's not just for, I mean, we feel that we're as integrated in with the village we call home as any college we know of. When I go to meetings of the Great Lakes College Association, which is a college association we're in, my fellow presidents complain constantly about their relationships with the community they call home. They have really challenging and difficult relationships that often get quite ugly. We don't have any of that, and we're really grateful for it and grateful for your support during these very challenging years in which we try to get ourselves back on our feet again. Well, thank you, and, and obviously the, the college is incredibly important to us, which is why we wanted you to come. Um, and I just, you know, communication is one thing, but just, and I, and I know Andy, I know, I know Reg are all aware of the processes of um, the permitting processes and those kinds of things that really have a, a, an absolute requirement for village government and, and that relationship. So I know, you know, just making sure that, that, that you're keeping up with that and that you're, um, doing all that is required. Reggie is a serious facilities manor, manager. He is not a serious tennis player. <laughs> <laughs> he would disagree with you on that, I know. Yes, yes he would, which is, which is what makes it fun. And did you say, did you give an opening date for the Wellness Center? June. June. And I can't get more specific than that. It is a little behind schedule, not much. The harsh winter has delayed things a bit. But again, please, if you haven't taken a tour, do. It's really going to be nice. And who, who would we contact? Well, that person would be, I think, close to my favorite person in the village, Dorothy Roosevelt. 
um, <laughs> who um, is at, um, oh boy, I better be able to do this. What's our, 319-6235. 319-6235. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, next is a review. Uh, oh, I guess we should add any other announcements. Yeah, actually, um, two things. Uh, the community access panel uh, has two open spots, and we've recently got uh, a few folks that have expressed interest. And so I wanted to let uh, all citizens know that uh, between now and the 13th, uh, if anyone is interested, please send an email to Judy Kittner. Um, we'd also like for anyone that's interested in this commission as well as other commissions to send a resume and any other details about why you're interested and what experience or background you have uh, that's something that um, you know we we want to make sure that we're making uh, the right decisions for commissions of council um, second thing I just wanted to briefly mention the uh, Public Art Commission I had talked about the last meeting is uh, going to be starting to meet again uh, and and that commission is full uh, we're going to meet the second Wednesdays of each month so our first meeting is February 12th Joanne Caputo is going to come to talk about the uh, bronze sculpture uh, trail um, uh, among other things uh, so that's what I have All right, thank you anyone else yeah and I have one <coughs> As everybody is probably aware, this month is uh, uh, Black History Month, so uh, there will be many events taking place, not only here but across the Miami Valley. Uh, I hate to see it as just being a month; it should be all the time. But if you have the opportunity, you know, take advantage of some of the, the, the good events and, and activities that will will be happening this month. At Wittenberg Fisk uh, University singers are coming the great uh, gospel spiritual singers um, there th it's in February I'll I send out an email blast I'll be sure to include that in my blast this month um, and my department is actually bringing Dennis Green who's a former member of Shana Na and was uh, <laughs> is a professor of law at University of Dayton and he uh, does a lot with black film so he's going to be talking about um, some black exploitation films uh, from the 1970s. Um, the spook who came, who sat by the door. Spook who sat by the door. He's going to be speaking about that on. My mother was in there. Really? <laughs> wow! So he's going to be speaking about that on. I think it's February 12th. I'll also include that in my email. Anybody who um, wants to get that from me. My, my email is on the web, so just send me an email and I'll let you know the details about that. And could you announce that? Sure. Um, uh, MVRPC um, is whole, uh, having final rounds of public open houses for the Going Places initiative. Um, and th the history is that we, over the past several years, people in Yellow Springs and all over the Miami Valley told the MVRPC what they want the region to be like in the future and they have created a draft list of, list of implementation strategies and tools to try to make the vision happen so this is um, these events are on uh, well the closest one is in uh, Xenia on Thursday February 20th uh, from 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, at Green County Jobs and Flan Family Services building that's that place where the election people are as well that's 541 Ledbetter Road and then also um, in Dayton on Tuesday February 25th at the Center for Regional Cooperation on that's on 3rd Street 1100 West 3rd Street um, I don't know if uh, well, Karen has anything more to say I've been involved in it. It, it this this is a very good thing because they're really working on sprawl they're really working on concentrating development around already developed areas and trying to deal with the fact that we have a lot more a lot more land for development than we really need and how do we how do we control it but how do we make it a fair process for communities so I think it's um, this is this is a phase we, we've been working on this for about three or four years now so now after after the the uh, public sessions then it will go back to the MVRPC board 
Um, the only other thing, if anybody, um, before we um, move on, just if you have any electronic devices, turn those off. That would be helpful. Or silence. Silence, <coughs> but yeah. Um, so then we'll move on to minutes. Um, January 13th. Did we not do these last week? We did not. We did not? Okay. January 13th. Okay, page one. Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. Page six. Page seven. Page eight. And page nine. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, then for the retreat, January 16th, um, I mean, these really aren't official minutes, but this is uh, a lot of what we talked <coughs> about. Um, anything on page one, page two? Um, I have a process question. Mm -hmm. yes. I don't have any questions about the minutes, but I do have a question about how we're going to uh, proceed regarding the decisions that we made. Can I bring that up under agenda review? Well, I think I mean a lot of the the um, a lot of this had to do with Judy putting together some some documents and calendars and things. I think a lot of it we tried to at least I tried to to um, include under our goals, which Lori had a, a blanket one to do what we said we were going to do. Yes, to which we which we made we which we made retreat. a goal. So. <laughs> so I'd say let's talk about that when we get to the goals. Okay. And then um, the minutes. Well, we should, oh, I guess a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Then uh, January twenty-first. Uh, Actually, Judy, that should say Tuesday. Shouldn't. Um, page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven. Motion? I, I move to approve the minutes. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Abstain. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, well, we don't have. Oh, this is uh, agenda review. Um, is is there anything in the agenda that um, I will mention that we are actually adding a piece of legislation um, regarding the manager search search process? But we will do that under old business. Um, or excuse, yes, under old business with the village manager profile discussion. It's a resolution. It's a resolution, so it's right? Not an ordinance. Um, anything else needs to change? Needs to. Um, and is Melissa? Melissa will be here for the budget discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, Lori, I, well, we've already done Laura Logis, the MVRPC, so we don't need to mention that again. Um, we don't have any public hearings and legislation other than the ones that the resolution that I just mentioned that we will get to. Um, citizens' concerns, the two that I had here are both going to be talked about um, in the agenda or during the meeting, so we won't hear them yet. Any other citizens' concerns about issues that aren't on the agenda? Okay. Uh, they are be out in the hallway. I think they're gone. Oh, did we? With so many people, um, can we get some more copies out there somehow, Judy? Mm -hmm. yeah. Just speak loudly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll get you a copy. How many are there? Others who need copies of the agenda? Okay, it looks like we need make them out five, and that way, if there are late comers. Okay. Um, I mean, was there anything Thank in you. particular, Carol? I mean, did, so, Carol. Was there anything in particular I, I can tell you if it's on the agenda or not? No, I'm just trying to look at the agenda, so I'll know. <laughs> okay. But so you were going to, you had something that you wanted to comment on? Not until I saw this. Okay. 
Oh, okay. Um, Uh, not specifically. We're talking about goals. Oh, it is in the goals, though. Right. It is in the goals discussion. But it's not specifically an agenda item. So if you have I a can talk about it then. sure, yeah, if you want to, you can talk about it then, or if you feel you would like to talk about it now during okay. citizens' concern. Okay. Okay. Um, so the next item on the agenda is. Oh, I see that Mr. Eastman isn't here yet. So I guess we need to. Um, and I did put that way too early. I forgot about John not being here. Um, is so Scott we'll, Straley well, why don't we go to the Scott is here and Joe is here, but um, okay. so let's let's move on to um, old business um, information on council manager form of governance. Okay. Kent. Sure, I'll try. Um, about a hundred years. Well. 150 years ago, uh, Andrew Jackson was our president. He was a populist, and Jacksonian democracy was built on the premise that there was no job in government that any reasonably sensible citizen couldn't perform. And that led to a lot of uh, excesses over time. Uh, patronage, favoritism, cronyism, uh, a lot of the corruption that afflicted late 19th century American government. And so there was a reaction to that, a reform movement. And part of the uh, reaction or the reform was an attempt to professionalize government. And in, the, in local government, that took the form of council manager government. And Dayton was an early adopter of that form of government. It followed the Great Flood in 1913. And it was partly a reaction to the insufficiency of the city's established uh, format to, to react to the problems that the flood created. So anyway, the, what was the underlying theme? There was, a, there was sort of a war cry. There's no, no Republican way to install a sewer, no uh, Democratic way to pave a street. These are technical decisions, and we ought to have competent, technically trained people making those decisions. And so council manager government grew out of that. The first city managers were mostly city man were mostly civil engineers. And uh, that's evolved over time too. Uh, one of our presidents, Woodrow Wilson, provided a theoretical basis for it. He said there was a policy administration dichotomy that elected officials like our city council or village council ought to be making value judgments. Uh, who's going to supply our water? for the city. And those are judgments that involve fact and um, substance, but they also involve values and, and emotion. And so policy decisions should be made by people who are reflecting the will of the community. Once the policy decision has been made, then we ought to turn it over to someone who's a professional and more dispassionate and that person ought to be deciding the nuts and bolts of how we do it. And in fact, one of the things I enjoyed about my first stint as village manager in Yellow Springs was a council would give me direction and then back out of my way and let me do it my way. And I used to joke that if they wanted me to put a storm sewer on Marshall Street, they didn't care whether I used two people in a back row or 10,000 trained gerbils with teaspoons. The question is, did it get done? Was it done effectively? Was it done at a reasonable cost? Did we get the result we wanted? And that, so that, that was a very nice working relationship. Um, now the problem with Woodrow Wilson is that he said it was either A or it was B. And in fact, it's not a dichotomy, it's a continuum. Because whether it's policy or administration really depends on history, and scale and who you're doing it to and a lot of other factors and uh, I can tell you that I got in a great deal of trouble and I'm not a sports fan I got in a great deal of trouble in one community where I work because our state our city basketball team was going to go to the state finals and the booster club <coughs> came to me and they said we're going to run a fan caravan to the state capitol for the basketball finals and we want a police escort we want two police cars and two officers in each car and I think, my God, you know, 200 miles each way, double time for the 
officers and on and on and I said no we can't do that well it turns out that in that community there was absolutely no better way to spend public money than supporting <laughs> the fan caravan to the basketball finals so uh, I, I learned I learned a quick lesson uh, not everybody is uninterested in basketball uh, but <laughs> uh, and I'll give you another example that happened here in Yellow Springs. We had a gentleman in town who sold uh, landscaping equipment, and he wanted the village to buy a gang mower, one of these big tractor-drawn tractor mowers with four decks that spread out behind it, and you could mow a 20-foot swath in one pass. And he wanted to sell one to the village to maintain our parks and our public spaces. And the village council at that time decided, no, we're going to hire 20 kids and provide them each with push mowers, and we're going to mow. We're going to keep the lawns better, you know, mowed that way. And he said, "Boy, is that stupid?" He said, "I understand my tractor is expensive, but it'll pay for itself in two or three years. Doing it with 20 kids is going to be a very costly uh, process over over a, over many years' time." And I said, "That's true. And if you're just looking at dollars and cents, it makes perfect sense to do it your way. But you have to realize that those 20 kids." have fathers and mothers and aunts and uncles and grandparents who vote. That's 20 kids who won't be standing on the street corner making trouble. It's 20 kids who will be making a little money they can put back into the economy. There are other factors than just dollars and cents that go into public policy decision making. So, um, so that's, that's the art of it, is understanding uh, not just the facts, but also wishes and aspirations and other factors and so I don't I say the government is not irrational but it's non-rational it's value driven so that's the real trick to being a good village manager if I can count myself in that category is the right striking that balance um, between uh, keeping people happy and doing what they want and keeping yourself happy meeting your own professional standards that you're doing a thorough job and doing it um, in, a, in a way that meets your own standards for being rational, reasonable, and economical. I have, I have a very clear set of criteria that I bring to the job, and this isn't universal, but number one for me is safety. Um, we had a person killed in Yellow Springs uh, shortly after I arrived here. They didn't work for the village. They were a contractor. They were doing something they were told specifically not to do, and they got themselves killed doing it. I don't ever want to face that again. So number one is, is safety. Uh, personally, I suffer some, from some poor judgments of my own using my motorcycles to ram cars. And I can tell you that some things you don't recover from. So safety is very important. Number two is effectiveness. I don't care how clever we are. I don't care how cheaply we do it. If we don't get the snow off the streets, nobody cares how cheap or how clever you were. You've got to, you know, if the water's not safe to drink, if you don't feel safe walking the streets at night. So effectiveness is my number two criteria. Number three is process. People don't think about it, but the thing that distinguishes government from any other kind of human organization is that we have police powers. We're the only kind of organization in the world that can legitimately say to somebody, you're going to do it our way or we're going to put you in jail. So because we have police powers, we have to be very conscious of how we do things. And that's why we have public hearings and uh, listen to the public that's why we have elections uh, number four is a f is I it's not efficiency in economy I think it's value people in Yellow Springs want some some nice frills in their local government uh, but they still don't and they've been very generous in supporting the village and supporting tax levies and things of that sort uh, but it's not a blank check they expect good value for their money and again that's part of my job is to, to provide that and then number five is balance uh, Balance between what the public wants and what's legal and reasonable. Balance between how well we pay our employees and how rigorously we tax the residents. I don't want to balance the budget on the backs of the employees. I don't want to provide soft jobs for employees so they uh, don't have to work hard uh, for a good paycheck. It's, it's striking that balance. It's important. So those are the criteria I use. I think one of the problems with council manager government is people look at the the Wilson theory they look at the charter which tries to define things in very black and white terms 
and then they try to apply that to how they do the job as village manager and it's an oversimplification it doesn't work number one is the consul's always in charge uh, you can say what you like about what the charter says well let me give you an example here's a check here's a piece of the charter neither the consul nor its members shall interfere in any way with the appointment or removal of any of the officers and employees in the administrative service except for the purpose of official inquiry the council and its members shall deal with the administrative service solely through the village manager now this is a small town and everybody at this table knows at least half of the village employees and they bump into them on the street or at Tom's market and they're likely to ask a question probably a breach of the charter uh, but we don't we don't stick with that when I was here Jim McKee retired we had to replace him we had a very rigorous process. We narrowed it down to two finalists. I went to the council and presented it to the council. The charter says it's my job as manager to make those appointments. And, but I know that a police chief is a very key, critical appointee. And so I consulted the council. I said, you know, we've done the process. Here are the two finalists. And I have a preference. My preference is candidate A. And they said that candidate is fine with us, so I appointed candidate B, candidate A. I would not. <laughs> candidate a. I, I would not have done it without consulting. I don't. No. Part of the deal is no surprises. I do a newsletter to council every week that tells them what's going on in the village offices, and again, no surprises. Um, Again, there's this huge gray area between what's their job and what's the manager's job. And so I may tell them, here's an issue the village is facing, and you've known it for six months, and you haven't acted on it, and it's becoming critical. So by next Tuesday at noon, I intend to do something about it. Now, you can stop me. Tell me if you don't want me to do it, and I'll get out of your way. But somebody's got to act, and I'm going to, I'm going to take the initiative. So, and other times I can say, here's something that's technically my job, but it has a huge public impact, and I'd like your suggestions and your advice on what to do, even though technically, theoretically, legally, it's a decision I can make without your input. So that's, so that's, the, that's the crux of making the thing work, is it's teamwork, it's collaboration, it's communication. Um, We're looking for another city manager, and I guess what I would look for are number one substantive knowledge. Uh, they, you know, one of our recent former managers, a year and a half after that manager arrived, I asked the operator of the water plant how often the manager came to see the water plant, and the answer was he hadn't been there yet. I'm sorry, that's shameful. Uh, you can't you can't sit in your office and, and do it by remote control. Uh, so substantive knowledge of the and. You know, it's engineering, it's finance, it's public relations, it's, you know, it's a whole personnel, public safety, it's a whole broad range of things. So they need, to, they're generalists, they don't have to be, they don't have to know everything, but they need to know enough to know when one of the department heads is uh, misleading. Um, the person needs to be flexible. In Yellow Springs, there are a lot of really well-educated people in the community. They are experts, and many of the people who aren't think they are. You have to treat them <laughs> respectfully. And uh, I, I joke uh, with my wife, we have a little different perspective. I have a book at home called Ten, uh, A Xenophobe's Guide to the Danes, and there are 10 commandments for being Danish. And about eight of them have to do with everybody's your equal. Everybody, uh, there isn't a person in the world that doesn't know at least one thing you don't know. And I try to work on that premise, whether it's the staff. And, and that's one of the big problems I see with my colleagues in city management. They're very bright, very capable people, but they often think they're the only ones who know the answers. And in fact, the best answers to problems that I've gotten over the years have come from people on the line who are actually doing the work. And so you need to be respectful, residents, the council, and your coworkers. Um, Flexibility. Uh, there's, a, there's a body of theory called systems theory, and one element of it is called equifinality. That's just another way of saying there's more than one way to skin a cat. Um, I, have a, I have goals of my own. I have things I'd like to see happen in the village, 
but many times people don't like my ideas, so let's find, is there another way, another, something else we can do that will satisfy my goals and still keep you happy? So flexibility, creativity, being imaginative, that's all part of it. And then finally, it's character. Uh, someone who, uh, I, I joke about some of my colleagues having a severe humility deficit. Can't, can't, <laughs> won't work. Uh, so honesty, integrity. Uh, I joke that uh, most city managers have a messianic self-image. And so uh, the, those vows of poverty, chastity, obedience, it works. Uh, they, need, they need to have all of that. Uh, there are changes. The, the theory is flawed. It doesn't work the way the law is set out, but um, it works because of a good manager is competent, conscientious, and to some extent controls the flow of communication up and down the organization, in and out. And it's how you communicate and your level of honesty that, that are a big factor in that. Some of the things that are, the technology is changing, and that's changing the way the job worked. Um, everybody has email now. When I, my last job, I was the director of a council of governments. Uh, we had eight member cities, and I was trying really hard to push email to every city employee in our eight member cities. Why was I doing that? Because I wanted to undermine the city managers who had control of the communication up and down the <laughs> and I thought if everybody could have email and everybody could communicate with each other, that this would uh, perhaps deflate some of the ego uh, that I saw running the, the government in some of our member cities. Uh, but so email is changing the, the scene. Uh, social media has made a huge change in local government. And uh, I can only say, Thank God I'm temporary. I'm not sure I could adapt. Uh, well, no, seriously. I, I, it's been 20 years, in, 20 years in April since I left Yellow Springs, and uh, the changes have just been huge. And uh, if I'd been able to adjust to it incrementally over 20 years, I'd probably be really happy trying to jump back in at the deep end. It's been a challenge at times. So uh, anyway, that's all I have to say. Thanks, Kent. Council, questions for Kent? Any questions from citizens for Kent? Okay. I, uh, I, I'd oh, just like to say go ahead. I, I, I thought that it would be useful for the community as we're starting this village manager search to have Kent talk about the role of village manager um, because I don't think it's always clear. <laughs> and even though council hires the village manager, village manager does have a lot of interaction with community members so mm -hmm. I just I just thought it would help get us more on the same page mm -hmm. yeah I'll give you an example this doesn't come from Yellow Springs but I worked in a community that had this really intractable problem the council just did not want to deal with and finally they said to me we want you to figure out what to do about it and wh whatever works for good or ill uh, you're gonna take the blame <laughs> and uh, so, so I did, and I, I kept my job, so it worked out all right in the end. <laughs> but uh, anything else? That's great. No, there's definitely lots of different opinions when we have different uh, people coming in. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really helpful to kind of have Kent's um, Kent's viewpoint as a sort of baseline, because uh, for me, I think he's really articulated in my experience on council I th that's how I've come to understand the kind of village council relationship we want philosophically um, of course if you feel differently I I'm I'm eager to hear from you but that that awareness that the p the policy says one thing but it's deciding what actually is policy and what is pure administration is complicated in a small village um, so uh, I I'm really appreciative of Kent for giving us that kind of baseline to judge other and to hopefully maybe give you ways of asking good questions to the candidates as they come and I think it will be good for the candidates and the final choice to hear from Kent to, to have Kent as a little bit of a mentor um, while while he's still on board and then as they're moving forward to work I think Kent will be an excellent mentor so um, 
The next item on the agenda is to talk about the village manager profile and also um, we're going to revisit the process. We had a, a, an executive session before the meeting um, with our attorney and also with the consultants. Um, we have a piece of legislation that our attorney is uh, telling us we, we missed in the process. Um, we always have a, a, uh, a resolution that that charges a committee and that seats a committee and that, that lists out what those charges are, what the responsibilities are. We miss that in the process, so we'll be doing that in, in just a minute after we've had some conversation. Um, there's also been a little bit of a change with the, uh, um, uh, with the uh, consultant, and I'd like to turn it over to, to Brian and or Jerry to, uh, to discuss that. Um, yeah, a couple things I want to clarify. First of all, uh, when we get to the resolution, I, I just wanted to mention that uh, <coughs> Megan Bachman, who was originally going to be part of the committee, um, cannot be involved. Um, so she has been replaced by Hannah Delamatre, and her name's uh, on this resolution that we'll get to. The second issue is uh, when we hired uh, the consulting group management partners uh, we did hire management partners and um, the original principal consultant that some of you might have seen his name Cecil Osborne um, who actually uh, helped us with the first step in the process which is to put together the position profile which are outside if you haven't seen that um, uh, is no is not able to continue uh, because of some family issues and uh, we actually met uh, well Jerry and I had originally met Jerry New Farmer who's head of the consulting group uh, and Cecil we've subsequently met uh, Douglas Plunkett who has worked with Cecil has worked with Jerry and you know again I want to emphasize that uh, I mean when we hired management partners we hired a group um, so we uh, did want to mention that we talked with Doug and Jerry and they feel very confident about passing off what Cecil's already started and uh, in fact if you ever read the management partners proposal they highlighted that this really is the driver of the process getting down what we're looking for in a candidate and so we as a council want to make sure that uh, we all feel good about this the citizen committee uh, had sort of a informal first meeting and we went through got some great feedback we've gotten feedback from Kent uh, all the council members have seen this and uh, if anyone does have any questions or comments today we, we would love to hear those do we want to talk about the process a little bit then or go to the resolution or? Um. Well, let's let's just review the process because it is slightly different from where okay. we were before. Um, so this was also on the table and in the packet. Uh, after talking with, uh, well, Jerry and I worked on this together. After talking with Kent, after talking with our village solicitor, as well as management partners, uh, we got a good, lot of good recommendations just about uh, what would make the most sense for the, the Citizen Council Committee. Uh, the first thing that we want to highlight is the nature of being an advisory committee. And uh, Council's very excited about citizen involvement as, as the resolution indicates um, we are basically up to in the the working timeline uh, today was about confirming our process uh, hearing any other comments and making sure that we we all feel good about that a um, couple main changes that were made on recommendation one is we had initially thought about interviewing and then some time in between and then the public forum but uh, management partners suggested that it would be good to have the top candidates come to the village uh, meet staff so we're thinking about like a Thursday Friday Saturday uh, meet village staff tour the facilities do interviewing and also do the public forum so that we have some time to really absorb that to also hear back from citizens uh, I do want to mention it is a working timeline so uh, we understand that there may be some hiccups in the process and it may take a little bit longer but we're gonna try as much as possible to keep it on schedule we also want to make sure that things are coming to our regular council meetings for any citizen feedback um, anything else 
I think those are the, I mean, I thought that was the, the sub substantive change uh, in the process. Um, most of the other elements, uh, I think we are still looking at preserving because, again, we do value uh, the citizen feedback along with supporting uh, the council piece so that we make a, find a good fit. Council, um, I guess we need to, are we all in agreement? Um, any other feedback from Council on the, uh, on the schedule we were given? Um, and also, I mean, we actually really are here to, to approve this document, the, um, the village manager profile, so that we can get that released um, you for candidates. Discuss those one at a time. Yes, let's, let's, uh, Let's, we were all looking at this, so let's start with the uh, village manager um, profile. We've all had, um, I think we've, we've had an opportunity to look at um, the content and the, um, the photographs, the visuals. And, and yeah, the uh, uh, advisory committee uh, unofficially met to read this very carefully, and we got a lot of great feedback that uh, was all incorporated. And I think the visuals at least do an incredible job of, of really showing the diversity of the community and um, kind of, and, and catching the services too um, that we offer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything? Marianne? Jerry here. Uh, no, no. So um, let's just do a motion to accept this and, and Should we hear make oh, sure there's citizens, any comments from citizens? Fine. Come on forward. Judy, you wanna do the mm -hmm. the timer? Carol Cobbs. Um, maybe I'm overreacting. I don't see the diversity. Um, so my concern would be that it might be a little more evident and that's the only comment I have in, in terms, of, in terms yes. of the photograph yes a pretty good representation personally not only of um, ethnic diversity but um, some of our other um, we have a pride photograph <coughs> any other comments This is a mock-up, by the way. The, the actual uh, brochure is going to be uh, on cardstock. make a motion or let's somebody else make a motion that we um, accept this as it is or if we want to make changes if anybody wants to recommend a change to anything and um, so that we I just want to have something official that we're releasing this for print I, I move that we accept this second all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. So then let's look at the uh, schedule, um, the working process and timeline. Um, as as uh, Brian said, there's still a little bit of flexibility on that. Um, and we haven't, we, we will still talk about the actual process we'll use um, for the candidates when they, um, the final candidates when they come here. Any other? Anything else? Well, see, my understanding was that when we get to the April 3rd, 5th, that 
the, not only the dates but maybe some of the process we'd consider tentative right yeah I mean I think okay. part of that will depend upon where the candidates are, are coming from if they're coming from a distance or close and so so I guess I would suggest in the title of this to say the 2014 village manager hiring advisory committee to put advisory committee in the mm -hmm. title I would actually instead of titling of that I would I would title it village manager hiring process right because really this is about oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. okay I agree and then maybe for those last on the second page put tentative mm -hmm. for maybe to put tentative and then put the dates under and I would also Brian um, it, it, in the past um, we have tried not to do um, Friday evening events um, because of the Jewish um, Shabbat I mean so try and, and I know when we've done it in the past it's it's created some concern people we could do upset. we could do it Thursday right okay Thursday would be better okay great great um, yeah, and I do want to emphasize, you know, it's also titled a, a working process. I, I mean, I do want to emphasize that in addition to what Mary Ann said that, you know, we do need to have a little flexibility. You might also want to see when the, when the spring holidays, religious holidays fall in here, because I think that there might be a couple that might be problematic. You mean like uh, Good Friday, Easter, um, Passover, right? Okay. Uh, so then we'll move on to the um, resolution it's resolution 2014-10 appointing a citizen advisory committee for the purpose of hiring a village manager I believe I screwed up that title sorry <laughs> I fixed it <laughs> sorry Whereas the Village of Yellow Springs has initiated a national search to hire a village manager, and whereas the Village of Yellow Springs Charter requires that all executive and legislative power of the village shall be vested in the council, and whereas council has determined to appoint a committee, the Citizen Advisory Committee, pursuant to the Village of Yellow Springs Charter Section 17.8, to assist council and council's consultant in determining the desired qualifications and character for an ideal candidate for village manager, and whereas the purpose of the creation and appointment of the Citizen Advisory Committee is intended to further the village's goal of an open government and participation by citizens, and whereas the Citizen Advisory Committee is intended to provide an advisory role to Council and Council's consultants as Council goes through the selection process to appoint a village manager, and whereas the Citizen Advisory Committee is a municipal body and therefore subject to the notice requirements set forth in Ordinance 2009-20, and whereas the Citizen Advisory Committee will participate in an advisory role to Council and Council's consultants in the process that will lead to the appointment of a village manager, public meetings may from time to time require the Citizen, citizen Advisory <coughs> Committee to enter into executive session as authorized and required pursuant to the section 121.22 of the Ohio Revised Code. And whereas the expected roles the Citizen Advisory Committee may provide to Council and Council's consultant include the Citizen Advisory Committee will review the resumes of potential candidates selected by the village's consultant and I'm going to skip that name here for the next little while if you don't mind. The CAC may participate in the interviews of village manager candidates as selected by management partners, council's consultant, and council. The CAC will work in conjunction with council and the council's consultant to organize a public forum in which village citizens can meet with finalists for the village manager position. Whereas the following citizens shall be appointed to the Citizen Advisory Committee. Sue Abendroth, Christine Monroe Beard, Hannah Delamater, Corey Johnson, Kate Hamilton, Beth Holyoke, Ryan Pearson, Bettina Sola Stolenberg. Stolzenberg. Now therefore the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio hereby resolves that. Section 1, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs hereby appoints the above named residents to be members of the Citizen Advisory Committee. Section 2, by adopting this resolution, Council retains all its powers granted under the Charter. Section 3, the Citizen Advisory Committee shall be disbanded upon appointment of the new village manager. Section 4, the Citizen Advisory Committee is a municipal body as divide, defined by Ordinance 2009-20 and subject to notice requirements and open meeting laws. Section 5, this resolution shall become effective upon its adoption. Can I have a uh, motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, and make sure that the typos and a couple of the names, uh, Sue Abendroth and uh, Stolzenberg. 
Those are the two I noted. A, B. Uh, discussion from council? Comments from citizens? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 <coughs> uh, next item on the agenda is um, council chambers renovation. Unless this no, I can do that real quick. John Eastman's not here yet. Yeah. Yes, he is. Oh, he is? Right. Oh, okay. Sorry, so, I didn't see you. I need my glasses. <coughs> uh, should we do the RCAP? Um, yeah, let's let's I think that would be good. Go to go ahead and go to RCAP. Okay, so all of our consultants are here. If I uh, could ask uh, John Eastman um, from LJB and Scott Straley from RCAP to come up. I don't know if if you all have decided how's how the presentation is going to go. Um, if you're all going <coughs> to come up or what? So. Um, this is a report, there was an extensive report in our packet, um, basically a report to um, describe the existing condition of the wastewater, or of the water treatment plant, and to go through a description of um, what needs to be done, and then a cost um, proposal, or a cost um, estimate of what those costs will be to do that. So um, I will turn that over to Whoever is going to report. Scott's going to start. Okay. Okay. Come up to the microphone, Scott. Introduce Thank you for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <coughs> Thank you for having us here. Um, I've been battling walking pneumonia now for too many days, so oh, I'm wow. still under the weather. I haven't been in the office in six days, so bear with me. But um, as most of you remember, how this all got started is we were looking at what are your options with your water system and there were so many options it was kind of overwhelming to decide which way you wanted to move forward and so after numerous discussions and many many months as you're very all aware what we came up with was we have some numbers for purchasing water from a neighboring water system we have some numbers for a brand new water plant that would give us a variety of options depending on if we wanted to go with softening, manganese removal, the, the things we wanted to incorporate or could incorporate. I say we, it's, we're all in this together. <coughs> the one piece that was out there was, what if we rehab the existing plant? And, and that was an unknown. And so we were tasked with, in conjunction with LJB and TriTech Engineering, looking at the existing facilities. What would it take to get 20 to 25 years per council's direction to get 20 to 25 years of existing life out of, of new life out of that existing facility how much money would that take that way you can compare we know that well we don't know but we can estimate that pipe in the ground can last 75 100 years we know that a water plant brand new before you're going to need major rehab is good for about 20 25 years depending on how well it's maintained the equipment inside that has certain life expectancies some of the equipment five years 10 maybe 15 or 20 so when you're trying to compare apples to apples which is what council wanted to do we needed that missing piece of the puzzle is okay what would it take to rehab the plant as we have now so when we were tasked with that LJB brought in their staff Tritech brought in their staff and uh, Joe, we walked through the plant and we looked at every nut, bolt, screw, light bulb, window pane, you name it. Okay, that plant was gone through very, very well to determine what would it take to get 20 to 25 years of life. So the report you see in front of you and that you've had goes into a little bit of depth. Okay, a lot of depth. Maybe a little bit ad nauseum. Maybe when you were reading it, you said, come on, seriously? What are we getting into here? But this is what it's going to take to get 20 to 25 years of life. So you can compare that now <coughs> to a new plant minus the cost of operations, minus the cost of maintenance. And as we noted in the report, what we've been doing for maintenance is going to need to be stepped up. There's going to need to be some more painting. So we look at budgets. When we look at how are we going to maintain and keep what we have, we have to factor those in as well. So the costs you have are very initial, very, very conservative. 
They're an estimate. It's an approximation. But what it allows you to do is now compare to the other pieces of the puzzle that you had and start to formulate a plan for how you want to move forward. Now, one thing we were looking at in doing this, per EPA's recommendations, was to add some manganese removal as well. So that's a piece that is an upgrade, if you will, from just maintaining the existing plant, but it's a necessary upgrade. We're not adding softening in there. We're not adding flashing neon lights, and there's not going to be a welcome to Yellow Springs well, greeter at the gate. Okay, just but this is what it's going to take to get your plant in line. And so just to go over those numbers, is we have an estimated $1.15 million that's going to go into the structural components of the plant, the processes, the electronics, the controls for what's going to be needed to bring that in up to date and to give you that 20 to 25 years. There's an additional design cost. And someone's going to have to design everything, facilitate how everything's going to come together, and that cost is going to be somewhere around $173,000. That estimate is 15% of the construction cost. It's typical in a brand new facility where you, it's just going to be breaking ground and building to see a 10% cost. John and I discussed it and 15% is a little bit higher, but because of the retrofit, because of the rehab, we feel pretty comfortable that that number is going to be a little bit higher. There's going to be more detail. There's going to be more coordination. So that's, you know, that's going to be a little bit higher there. And then you also have for permitting, administrative cost, construction administration, oversight, those type things, typically estimated at 5%, give you roughly $58,000 in those costs bringing the total to roughly 1.38, 1.39 million dollars to, to compare the facilities versus purchasing. Now keep in mind, this is 20 to 25 years of life. You need to be planning for what do we do after the 20 to 25 years. And that's all part of it. You need to plan for contingencies. You need to plan for emergencies. You need to plan for maintenance those type things. So with that, since we have Joe, since we have John, Kent's been a great part of it as well in getting this to this point, what I'd like to do is kind of step back since you've had time to read it. If you have any specific questions, why was something added? Why was something not added? Um, and, and take it to that point. And then maybe allow John a few opportunity, a few minutes opportunity to, uh, to wrap up. So are there any questions, comments, concerns? I have a question. Um, does, <coughs> does the rehab lend itself to design build? Or I, I know that that's one of the things that we were talking about with a new plant. Um, is it, is, would the same hold true with the rehab? Boy, I, uh, when you get to, in my experience with design build, what you have to do is you have to have very exacting specifications, very exacting directions up front in order to get a contractor and an engineer to give you exactly what you want. Any loose ends, and you're opening yourself up to a lot of problem. It could be done in this case, in this scenario, with this type of rehab, since it's encompassing so many things, I think design build would be a nightmare a brand new plant and we're doing that in a couple other areas where you specify we want a certain type of design we don't care about all these little things just give us something design build can work and it does work so my recommendation for a rehab repair this t this type of work would not be is, so so the engineer the engineer is going to be able to get all of those details I mean that typically um, rehabs just <coughs> you're going to see a lot more um, change orders because people can never know up front what is really going to happen once they start until they get into the project and that's why we see and like when you specifically and I've, I was part of the 2002 design build project of the year national this project of the year and we had very specific up front very specific details, very specific specifications. Any kind of fluctuation in that, and that can lead you down a path you don't want to okay. go down. Yeah. What I really don't expect a lot of change orders once the engineering is done, or the, both the architectural and the process, in part because 
the things that need to be changed are largely in sight. They're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not hidden out of sight. So we're going to be able to know what they are and be able to document those. And the 15% versus 10% is really the, um, the number of different things that have to be documented that are, many of them are small costs. So the actual documentation of something that's a relatively small cost is a higher percentage than the documentation of something because the, the basic cost of the building is already there. We're not, you're not going to be paying for the fundamental cost of the building which would be the easier thing to document <laughs> from scratch. But um, I think the, that in a final design process, working with village staff, there may be ways to say, OK, we're going to split this up into a couple different contracts. Certainly, the electrical and controls um, is pretty much going to be gutted and replaced. So the specification of the, the new controls, the um, SCADA system, and things like that, is more like new construction because what's there is so outdated and, and not upgradable. Did that answer your question, Karen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Scott, I'm really nervous about the prospect of trying to maintain service at the same time we're rebuilding the plant that provides that service. Can that be done? I think I, I can speak to that. Is there was one critical component that I was really nervous about when I spoke in front of council before, which I call the face piping. And how was that face piping going to be taken out of service? I have since you know, I, I went really spent some time thinking that through that process. It turns out that by a very um, modest lowering of the control level in the clear well, we can actually take. Um, the face piping for one filter out of service at a time, leaving the other two ser filters in service. So we would have one, f we'd be able to do the rehab filter by filter, leaving the other two filters in service. The, I was concerned also that the clear well, if that needed something significant, but in re looking at the uh, videotapes that the divers made of the clear well and the reaction basin, it's structurally there in good shape. So we're not needing to, to take those out of service. Um, so my major concerns about that very issue are not there today the way they were previously. Scott, based on your comments, uh, it seems like uh, to have a water plant last for 50 years like ours is, is atypical. Um, I mean, why, why have we got so much life out of it? And then maybe uh, the second question is, how does that impact thinking about rehab? The fact that you've gotten 50 years out of your plant, there have been some things done, there have been some pumps replaced. Um, if you take a look at the state of the nuts and bolts, which we have a picture in there, right. and as much as they're rusted, and it, I've seen it. it's a ticking time bomb. Mm -hmm. So when do you replace the tires on your car? Um, mine are rated for 70,000 miles. Do you replace them at 60? Do you replace them at 70? Do you replace them at 80, 90? How much do you push the envelope? Yeah. Scott, there's another answer to this too. I mean, well, uh, I mean, okay. another, not a different answer, but another piece of information that you may have. <laughs> um, one of the things is the plant as a whole did not last 50 years. The roofs have been completely replaced in the past. The filters have been completely rejuvenated in the past. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they, the, all the internals of the filters were taken out, the new um, under drains put in, new filter media put in. So there have been already major, um, not as major as what we're talking about now, the but there have been, ma uh, it wasn't like nothing happened for 50 years. Right. I mean, you look at the Springfield plant, that's even older than ours. I think it's from the 50s. Yeah. Ours is from the 60s. Um, and it's in very good shape. There's you know it's been regularly maintained um, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's it, even with this when you say could you explain the the notion of the 20 to 25 years and why we sort of went with that number and, and why that's kind of what engineers can kind of do well there's a couple reasons for it one is that for many if you look at kind of the range of what will happen with a building. You know, when do roofs need to get replaced? Well, you know, most homeowners know that you can get 25 year shingles, you can get 30 year shingles, you can get whatever. But there's a period where there's sort of natural 
times on those. When you look at a, a significant structural components, many of them are in that range, depending on how much you put in up front, anywhere from 20 to, to 30, 40 years. Unlike, say, ductile iron pipe, which typically will last 75 to 100 years. Um, so there's a standard things. The other reason why often 20 to 25 years is used as a time frame for analysis is that um, typically that's how they're funded. <laughs> so if you fund something over 20 years, and it doesn't mean you have to have it wear out at the end of your funding cycle, but that's when you now have additional funds ready to make upgrades or to do further things down the road. So that's another reason why it's commonly in that general range. And when you start getting out beyond 25 years, you, if you build, you know, if you put up basically, con you know, solid masonry buildings, you know, we know buildings, I mean, what, Antioch College buildings, the f basic structures, what, 200 years old, or 250 years old. So, but those structures have had major upgrades at different points in their time. They didn't last 200, or what was it, 200, 250 years with nothing done to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't know, if did that really answer your yeah. question? Yeah, I think that helps clarify it. Scott, I, you did say, when you were talking about a new plant, you said, you even said 25 years with a new plant. Is that before some major systems would be looked at? Because I thought when we were talking about a new plant, we were actually looking more in terms of 50 years. With the, with the artesian plant, um, I think the plant, the process itself may last that long, but you're still going to have, and again, as John just spoke to, you're still going to have those costs at about 20 to 25 years. We see it across the country. We see it across the state. It, it's, it's pretty much industry standard that something's going to happen. You're going to have to replace, you're going to do, you're going to do a big capital improvement project. Now is it to the tune of 1.4 million? It might be half that. It might be double that. You know, we, it depends on what's going on, how it's maintained, how it's operated, what happens with your regulatory agencies and those type of things. So we typically see, and if they're, if they're telling you it's going to last 50 years without doing anything major to it. I don't think he said that. But yeah, it's just then, then we need to look at those things. You know, equipment just does not last that long. Right. So, so it's like you have to start thinking about the roof might need to be replaced after 25 years. Ago. Right. You might have to replace <clears throat> some major components right, in right. The, the pumps mm -hmm. and whatever. But there's no reason to believe that if we do this, that in 25 years with, with renovating the existing plant, we do what we need to do in 25 years. I mean, there is no reason that this plant as a, as a plant can't continue as long as we're maintaining it. Sure. I mean, so the, the technology sound, um, what you're doing, the processes, everything is in place. Um, now, I think Ken's question about how do you juggle things when you're doing maintenance on it, John had a great answer to that. Well, what if something else happens? What if lightning strikes and you lose all of your controls? Well, what if? You know, there are ways to put in redundancy. There are ways to build in safety factors that you can continue operating. Um, and, and just by taking a look at those, you'll be able to continue on. But as it stands now, and, and I think it was in the report that there's nothing that says the plant needs to be completely scrapped. Um, it's, it's, it's worth investigating, which you've taken the time to do, the potential to rehab and repair. And it isn't possible, or, or is it possible to add softening to this? That's one of the other elements that... To... Um, the current filtration process is what we call a gravity filter. So it goes from the wells and goes up to a high point and then from there through the aeration process through the filtration it's by gravity into a clear well. From the clear well it's pumped to the, um, the tower, into the system, into the tower. What artesian is, uh, so with that system to add softening you would essentially have to add another intermediate clear well. You'd have to go from the wells through the aeration through the filters to a place where you would then pump it through the softener to the clear well, to the existing clear well. So there's, it's not just adding softeners, it's adding another um, 
sump system or clear well system with another set of pumps. With the artesian system, and I was trying to find the letter that they had written about what they were proposing because with the artesian system they're talking about putting in pressure filters. So with the new plant, instead of having gravity filters, there would be large pressure vessels, steel, steel tanks with the media, the filtration media inside the tanks. And then you would pump through those pressure vessels and then directly through the softeners and then to the clear well. So with a new plant, you could incorporate the two of those together in a way that's more, much more difficult with the current plant. Mm -hmm. However, if you add the softening, add that pressure process, you need to upsize the well pumps because now you need to have those well pumps produce more pressure to drive it through the process. Each, each change has a ripple effect through the rest of the system as to what, what needs to be done. So. I think, Karen, the, the simple question is, it's far more difficult to add softening or su substantially more difficult to add softening to the existing process than it would be with a new plant. Okay. And in both cases, it would, the expectation is it would be ion exchange softening. The alternatives are, are, would be difficult and very costly mm -hmm. for Yellow Springs to implement. Do we want to hear from Joe next and then ask for citizen comments? Oh, yeah. I, I have some oh. questions. For, for those two? Well, I don't, yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, so I have several questions. One is, are there particular challenges to rehabbing the plant? Um, I'd also like to get a sense of what the result, how that would compare to a new plant. I mean, John just mentioned one, that the filtration system would be different. But if you could just sort of give some general highlights to what difference we would get with a new plant. Uh, and then there was mention uh, in the report that some of the technologies are dated but acceptable. Uh, so my question is, are there any technologies that would be used in a rehab that you would question the advisability of continuing those technologies? Is that so? Challenges, contrast rehab with existing in terms of you know the main features and. Uh, any technologies in the rehab that that you think are so dated that they you wouldn't want to continue? It would be better not to continue them. Yeah. I, okay. The um, the primary challenge the the, the primary challenge um, was whether we could do it without shutting down the entire plant. That's been answered and was answered before the report was written. So that challenge has been removed from the report. Um, the other challenges are basically things like a, a contractor is going to have to separate the filter room with bisqueen with other things to be able to um, empty one of the filters to uh, blast the sandblast the walls to paint to do all the things and then you have to move to the next one so there's challenges to sequencing that kind of thing which are typical kinds of challenges that contractors have to do when they do a rehab. So it's, I don't think there's any challenge, I can't see any challenges that are outside the normal that you would expect contractors to be able to, to handle and manage. The, um, see the second one was? The contrast, the sort the of con finish. Contrast. Um, let's see. Well, one thing that I want to make clear about is that some of the things you see in the pictures that have to do with the corrosion are because there's never been dehumidification in the building. That's something that any water treatment plant that I deal with in these days, I'll never design a water treatment plant that does have, doesn't have dehumidifiers. And that makes a huge difference in preventing corrosion, maintaining the quality of the paint, maintaining the whole environment of the plant. So. 20 years from now, it's not going to look like it does now because that key component will be there. And that'll need to be there regardless of the type of plant. Um, it's not just that we have this particular style plant. It's, There's a lot of water. It's a lot of water, but also what's more important with this is that it's groundwater temperature at around 55 degrees. And if you have a big steel tank if, with the artesian process or piping in this process, it's at 55 degrees and you have uh, hummer, summer humidity and that hot humid air comes in, it's gonna condense. 
Well, the same way it does on any other cool surface. That's the issue with dehumidification, um, is that hot, humid air in the summer coming in and condensing on anything that's in a treatment plant at, at those temperatures. Um, I think the other thing, my understanding of Artesian's design build scheme or proposal is basically much like a pole barn type structure. And it's, I don't think they were not going with the masonry structure. They were, I don't know, we didn't ever get into the details of how they would build the building. So, and you would, you would probably walk into a large open space and there'd be a lot of tanks and piping in that space is what would be seen. Uh, distinct from now, there's separated spaces. The aeration space in the existing plant is essentially a exposed to the, the outside, water's cascading down, very humid environment. You don't de dehumidify that. The filters are open water surfaces. So those two spaces, the aeration space and the filter space, you expect to be humid and you close them off from the rest of the building. Um, and then we've got, the plan would be to use a totally different type of surface coatings on those spaces to have them last better than what's been there in the past. There's more modern uh, paints, there's um, some other materials, Zypex being one, that can coat those walls and ceilings and keep the paint from peeling the way it has in the past. The other thing in answer to the question about what you, would you see differently, um, I don't think the Artesian proposal put in a nuclear well and high service pumps. I'm not sure of that. I'd have to go back and find their, their letter. So their process would presumably dump into the, high, <coughs> into the existing clear well and the high service pumps. And so if I'm correct in that memory, then you still have whatever needs to be done in that building and with that equipment. Um, so that we'd have to interface there. I think before you'd want to rely totally on a number for a new plant, we've got to make sure that all the, the coordination pieces are included. Um, what is going to be the need for the size of the well pumps and increasing those. I think the, the, the last question you had, or the comment Just you about, had. about the technologies. The technologies. The, <coughs> the basic technology for manganese removal is the same whether it's gravity filters or pressure filters. So you could say in one sense, I think I remember a discussion among some people that a gravity filter system is an older technology than a pressure filter system. I'm not sure I agree with that. There's a lot of gravity filters that are built today Smaller systems often go to pressure filters because the, the um, ability to do pressure, steel pressure vessels is better now than it was 50 years ago or 60 years ago. So there's a, there's a trend toward that, um, using pressure vessels. The, um, but the, the fundamental technology of manganese removal is the same as it's been for a long time. Now there are some new media. The actual filtration media has been improved, but I would expect exactly the same filtration media to be used, whether it's a gravity filter or a, um, a pressure filter. The, the other thing that really has changed dramatically are, are controls. Yeah. Variable frequency drives, um, all the control technology, the SCADA, the ability to communicate back to the wastewater plant and to have Joe have be able to monitor things at the water plant. All of that technology is vastly different than it's ever been before. And again, that will be very little difference between a, a new plant or a rehab plant. Okay. The controls will be essentially entirely new. We're, so state of the art kind right. of. State of the art. There'll be almost nothing left of the old controls or electrical stuff at the end of this. Council, any other questions? With, I do want to hear from Joe. So let's bring Joe up and then we'll see if there are any more questions from citizens or um, council. Statements, yeah. um, I appreciate John and Scott and all their efforts in this report. Um, I think it's very comprehensive. Um, we, had, Kent Bristol and I had a discussion with John on the phone. There's some little details that uh, are missing um, that me and my operators have went through this report and those are things we can iron out as decisions are made mm -hmm. but um, my, my biggest concern is the concern Kent brought up is 
is it's it's like living in a house that you're rehabbing it's very challenging mm -hmm. and um, to keep water in the towers to keep water coming out of your spigots um, it's a little different than the wastewater project in my expectations mm -hmm. and John talked about the plumbing I think more about the electrical like when you shut the electrical down um, you know you have to have a contingency of how the pumps are going to run while you install new equipment and those are all things that I'm sure can be figured out but are a challenge to me as an operator mm -hmm. and um, it's a little different than the wastewater project and I'm sure John would agree with that the wastewater was typically gravity um, you had tanks where you could store water or divert it uh, this this is critical that everybody has water all the time you know right. so those are my concerns right council any other questions for anyone well I have a question which is going to be ongoing I think but I'd just like to mention it now regarding the softening process mm -hmm. um, because we're, we're going to have to decide um, well if we do a rehab we won't be softening it right if we do a new plant then we will have to decide and my concern about the softening is that it because it's ion exchange it puts sodium in the water that it it would impact the taste and that also conceivably might impact people with health concerns <coughs> And I just want to put that out now because it's something that I want to investigate more. And, and I will tell you that that is the reason that Springfield is on the table. Because softening was identified as something that there was a big desire in the community for. And because Springfield does lime softening, that was seen as um, it's just a better product. It's, it's better water and it is more environmentally friendly. So that's the reason we're talking about Springfield, is that it was a, a much less expensive way to get softened water. So you're right, that is a discussion that we're gonna have to have. That is, that is part of these values, that's part of this discussion that Kent's laying out, that, that council and the community are gonna have to have, that really the consultants, they don't care what what kind of a plant we have. Joe may care. Joe, Joe might very well care. Um, I live here too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you need to separate yourself as a consultant, John. Yes. Yes. Um, so let's, let's hear from the community. Um, any questions from citizens? Um, Bill. Uh, my um, con concern with Springfield is that if the water line is run from Springfield down to here, I believe that will um, lead to a lot of development between Springfield and here along Highway 68. And I think we should think about the impact of that beyond just water, but what kind of, what is this community gonna be like? What is the surrounding areas gonna be like? And do we want to drive through densely developed areas when we come from I-70 back down? To, spring, to um, Yellow Spring. Chrissy? And to please remember to Oh yes, yeah. your name and please state your name. Uh, sorry about that, Judy. I'm Chrissy Cruz. <coughs> Excuse me. I was um, glad that you brought up the point about the 50 years because I distinctly remember being here for that meeting where they talked about a new plant and he was pretty clear with us that it would be guaranteed for 50 years to be absolutely minimal maintenance, minimal. And I remember even more distinctly because a few days later I had a conversation with John Eastman about it where he explained to me that that was probably a slight under exaggeration as far as um, I remember what, what was the company was is it artisan the guy that yeah artis artesian he said that basically for 50 years our cost in maintenance for the for a new plant would be about equivalent of a thousand dollars to us nowadays and that's what John said was probably an underestimate so I just want to make sure that we revisit that because then really in the long run it's not oranges to oranges if we're saying 25 years for a rehab as compared to a new plant which is going to be 50 years so that's that's really not quite oranges to oranges as far as I'm concerned I mean you, you may remember differently I remember distinctly he said a thousand dollars in maintenance costs per year well, I mean, we're talking about a different process. I mean, he, he's doing a design-build process, so he has a little bit more um, responsibility for 
the specifications and the actual design of the of the plan. I mean, certainly we're, we need to revisit all of those before we make any final decisions. I don't think anybody could say that in 50 years you wouldn't have to replace a, a roof or yeah. you wouldn't have to replace well, like a I major said, component. That was, that was an underestimate. Yeah. I, I can't imagine it would be dramatically Well, the other thing that, that I think if we talk about where we move forward to make comparison among these things, there's a standard economic process of whatever we choose is the life of a rehab plant, the life of a new plant, the life of a ductile iron line to Springfield. Each of them have a different life. Each of them have a different first cost. Each of them have a different operations cost. And one of the things you do in each one of those situations is to look at what's the annual operating costs of staff, of chemicals, electricity. And you also add in a factor for the things that are going to be replaced. You know, let's say certain pumps are going to be, certain components might be replaced every five years. Just like you replace, uh, uh, you get an oil change every 3,000 miles. <laughs> Some things happen in a certain time frame. Other things happen in a different time frame. Your tires get replaced on a different time frame than your brakes. So there's, you look at the different components of a plant and you come up with which are the things which are the periodic replacement costs. And you figure in essentially the annual equivalent of that. So you bring everything back to a common economic basis where the time frame is taken into account as well as all these components along the way. And then you can say, here's the true, or the bringing everything back to an annual cost, the capital cost back to an annual cost, the periodic cost back to an annual, add in the maintenance of cost, the electricity and so forth. And here's what the equivalent cost per year is for each of the three alternatives then you've got a true economic comparison and then you can factor in all of the non-monetary things and by non-monetary thing what's the value of hard water versus soft water what's the value of maintaining local control what's the value you know what is the risk of development along the 68 corridor um, and, and you factor in those non-monetary factors um, in, on top of the economic analysis. Thanks, John. Um, any other citizen comments? Dan? And we really, we need to wrap this up. We still have a lot, a lot on the agenda, so we're going to be wrapping this up soon. Uh, hi, I'm Dan Reyes. Uh, I, I, I was just thinking to add um, uh, one sort of observation that reinforces what these gentlemen were saying, I, I believe, uh, about the time frame for the comparisons. And although it's a bit different, it's off the map in a sense, because each of you folks are, or of these folks are talking about it from a uh, engineering and technical side. And, and there's also, though, the political economic side of the time frame uh, that you'll be looking at as you're trying to compare, or at least some people from the audience have talked about comparing the different options uh, that are in front of the village. And there are different options in terms of the type of arrangement, business arrangement, that would be uh, undertaken, whether it's with an outside vendor in the case of Artesian, whether it's with another municipality in the case of Springfield, or whether it's with this community in the case of Yellow Springs mm -hmm. doing work on itself. Uh, and it's difficult, I would suspect, if you go more than 25 years down the line uh, maybe with any of these, but certainly with two of them, uh, with the municipality or with the company that would like to come in and be a vendor, uh, to predict who's going to own those enterprises or what the management structures and disposition of those, you know, either communities or organizations are going to be. Uh, there, there is more control with the community working on itself in a certain sense. And I, I think that's maybe a philosophy in a certain, in, in a way, but uh, as you go out past 25 years, I think making bets about what will be going on in Springfield or what might be happening with um, the Artesian company uh, is pretty hazardous. So, you know, kind of keeping it narrow to the 20 to 25 years is, is probably prudent from a number of points of view. Thank you. Um, Kent, um, have you put together a, uh, a kind of a, a road map of moving forward on this, how we're going to go about getting the kind of information that John talked about, this comparative information and a timetable? I think council at the last meeting 
we would like to get to a decision point while you're still here mm -hmm. so that when the new manager comes in we can turn the project over to them to move forward do yeah. we have a John and Joe and I have talked and we think we can get together and have something <coughs> ready for the next council meeting okay you know we had a financial analysis it was done obviously before this rehab analysis are you talking about rates now right no, it no, was no. it was utility. It was I I have it Did somewhere. It's it called you. I've got it in my okay. giant. Yeah. I just case. wanted to make sure, as long yeah. as he is aware that that document exists. Yeah. So yes. some it's some finance. No, no, no. no. It was from utility um, systems. Lady, lady utility finance yeah. or yeah. something <laughs> like that. I've got so I've got Karen the report. Will have it, and she'll make sure to yeah. get it to you. We don't have to find it right now. But just be aware that yes. we did have a, a sort of cost analysis. I can't remember how many years she went out, but what it would, what each option would cost, cost. each year, and how how it would uh, how, uh, an estimate of how each might impact rates. Okay. So some of that has been done. Yeah, yeah I, th I think I do have a copy of that as well, mm -hmm. and I was there for that presentation. There's some good information in there, and I was also. It's experiencing that there was some really not just that they didn't have the rehab option but right. there were some aspects of how that was being analyzed that were different than how I was seeing needed to be done so it's good input information needs to be considered yeah and I, I actually remember having the same feeling and, and the more I've learned about it the more I feel like I'm, we maybe didn't get all the information and I do have that report so I can make sure okay. that if, and, if okay. you can't and find I, it that I can bring my copy and it was also based upon the, the belief that we were realizing like a 35 or 40 percent water loss and we've since realized that that's not the case so those <laughs> numbers are, are somewhat off um, yeah. so um, okay. so the next meeting it sounds like we'll did, have did, a report did we, excuse me did we ask for that or how, how did we get that um, that was from that was part of Laura's um, okay. research okay. Um, process you know, maybe wouldn't you know with some different assumptions and maybe might give us a little bit different opinion or a better opinion so you know right mm -hmm. well ul ultimate, ultimately uh, you know you'll get to the place where you'll make a decision as counsel on behalf of the community of what way you want to go and then there's a, as part of that overall decision will be what do you want to do with rates and this information feeds into the rates it's so this is what comes first and then the Right. Knowing where the rates have to be comes afterwards. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, we need to move on. Yes, move on. Council we'll chamber. we'll thank you all. Yeah, thank thanks you. Scott. Thank you thanks much. Joe. Hi. Thanks John. So at the next meeting, we'll have a report on on moving forward. Um, next, we'll talk. Jerry said he could talk briefly about council chambers renovation. <coughs> yeah. It, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> it, it, and, and I'm not really pushing the, the rehab, but one of the things we, we are also looking at is the ability to make presentations that everybody can see and understand. And so that's kind of why I'm, I'm moving a little bit slower because we're, we're looking at what is the best medium to use for presentations and and the other final piece that we need to get is the, the sound system mm -hmm. okay. and, uh, so as soon as we can get that gentleman in here to uh, to look at uh, what our options are there and that's the gentleman from the uh, or from MVCC yeah right that's that's the last little piece but, uh, and then uh, uh, I've got most of the numbers and and that's the other number that I need is what that is and so forth. Okay. okay. Um, Bill, you had a comment? Um, yeah, it's really a question. And Bill Firestone, yeah. Um, it's about the process for selecting architects and engineers for construction projects. And I guess it would really apply to the previous one. And, and I'm wondering, are those, um, are, are there, are bids taken? And are, is there an open process for selecting architects and engineers? I uh, overheard at the budget hearing last time that there was a consideration of a $120,000 library restroom renovation and then I also heard the village council president's husband's name mentioned in that context and I would hope that there's some sort of an open rigorous process for selecting professionals 
to work for the village? Uh, we do always have an open process in every in every case. Uh, maybe Kent can talk to about well, how I, that works. I haven't done it. So. Right, I know, <laughs> but you you've done it in the past. So, and how does it generally work? Frankly, thirty years ago, we didn't. We had established relationships with Wolpert Engineering, for example, and generally we turn to them to have something done. So I think now we do put out a request for a proposal or a request for qualifications. Uh, we're doing that with a swimming pool, for example. Uh, we're, we're advertising it. We're going to try to contact any companies we know that are in that business, invite them all to participate. So. Thanks. Good. All right. Any other comments? Yeah. Uh, um, someone suggested to me that we might look into lapel mics. Oh yeah, yeah, all that's being taken into consideration. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. No, we haven't. We haven't, you know, uh, stopped at one solution. So no. Okay. Um, next on the agenda is a CBE update. I will be recusing myself, so I'll turn um, the meeting over to Lori. Okay. I don't know who is giving the CBE update. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you a little bit, and maybe Jerry can uh, fill in any details I miss. Right. We had a, uh, a meeting last Thursday where we invited planning commissioners, council members. Kent, I think maybe people are having trouble hearing Kent's okay. voice. I'm sorry about that. All right. It really helps to speak into these mics. Okay. We had a meeting last Thursday where we invited many people involved with the CBE project, uh, community resources, the engineer, uh, planners, planning commission members, council members, clerk of council, or city attorney, and talked about what the options were. And the conclusion was that the current zoning for that district is ill-suited to what we want to do, and we ought to rezone the property as step one. And so right now, our planning uh, administrators, the zoning administrator, is putting together a chart that compares all of the options. Um, what's the current zoning? What are the other districts we're currently using? What was the district? <laughs> what was the district in place when the uh, original plans were conceived, and so on? So we can do side by side comparisons and decide uh, what to do next. But once we've done that, we'll be going to Planning Commission and asking them to take action and then go on to Council. And once the zoning issue is settled, then we have to present the plan. So it's two sets of steps through the Planning Commission and the Council. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Jerry, Jerry have I missed anything? Speak to any, any, any other details? Uh, Jerry Sutton uh, with CR. One, uh, I would like to thank uh, Kent for convening the uh, meeting. I thought it was pretty good. I just characterized the results a little different as opposed to characterizing the current zoning as inappropriate right now. We're gathering information to see if it is appropriate or if there's rezoning would be a viable alternative that would get uh, an economically appropriate product out of it. So. I think there, as Kent said, there's a number of steps. First, the analysis, uh, and then there's also a thing called schedule. And I'm very interested in what the administrative schedule is. Mm -hmm. What steps have to be taken? When that will they? Is an optimistic time that they get them done? So we have schedule. Yes. Uh, I noticed that Kent says three or four months to complete. I've got 50 cents that it won't be done in that period of time. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're right, Jerry. Have, did, I don't know if, it would be, if, it, if anybody thought it would be worthwhile to talk to Paul LeBlanc about the, the PUD that he suggested putting in there because, or, or if I, that's just kind of. I, I have talked failed. to him. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And, yeah. What he said was what we all believed, which is that there was a plan, that it had been reviewed, that everybody was on board with it. And so the code was written specifically to exempt the CBE 
from the review that would be required under the new PUD re uh, uh, process. But that was assuming that that, that was assuming that it was all done, gone through. right? Right. That the public process had already taken place, so it right. didn't need to be redone from yes, scratch. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, because the the code specifically exempts CBE. It says it's going to proceed uh, under the conditions and with the plan that have already been approved. Right. Which hadn't didn't happened. happen. Right. Okay. <clears throat> um, so I, I was at that meeting, and I would just add. A, couple things um, my sense is that probably the most likely scenario is that it would be rezoned light industrial that might not be the case but that sort of seemed that and if that were the case then my understanding is also that there wouldn't necessarily be any conditions placed on that parcel by Planning Commission at least at that time and that 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 the the rezone would go through planning commission to council and then if that were the case then the parcel would have to come to planning commission and council to be subdivided but that the engineering the road and the infrastructure is not something that planning commission would put conditions on that, that was my understanding yes but it would be a subdivision process it would be divided into however many parcels that road creates which is three I think uh, one two three yes three um, the other thing that we talked about at the meeting was we're assuming that there it's very likely that there would be a referendum and so um, we wanted to make sure that the process to do the rezoning and the subdivision would also allow time for there to be a referendum which would then likely be put on the November ballot yes that's our goal to get everything done in time so that if people do oppose it and want to have a referendum they can be done this year yes okay I, I have one other this is sort of a next step thing I would like to see the village start the process of examining um, whether or not we want to have a designated community improvement corporation and I've talked there's been a small working group um, that I've been a part of Jerry and I have been a part of with a couple community resource people and John Eastman as a township trustee and we've talked about moving forward on that process but um, I, I would imagine that that needs to come from council and I'm not sure we talked about maybe having a task force that would look into that to me it seems like we would want our attorney to look at all the legalities and come to back to us with what's involved legally to do that um, we probably want to talk to the Green County get a s more sense of the Green County com Community Improvement Corporation I would want to talk to other communities that have a designated CIC certainly we would be in communication with community resources about that right. so I'm not sure how to start that process but I think it makes sense now that we have this mm -hmm. totally changed time frame that we need to be looking at the different things that it would have been nice if they had been done before to now we have time to do those and that's one of those things so I'm well, at, perhaps I, what, would, what would make sense to me and you can tell me whether this would be to bring a proposal for process um, maybe you and Jerry together or um, just writing a, a brief like task force um, and just and bring it bring it in writing what you think would be the the process because I doubt anybody sitting at this table it's a spec it's a specialized enough process maybe Kent has some specific insight to offer um, but it would probably um, you're probably in the best position to bring that to council okay Jerry yeah okay okay uh, maybe one other update uh, we had another interesting meeting with uh, and this was actually a recommendation of Don Johnson's uh, Martin Russell from the Warren County Port Authority uh, met with a group of us and um, we want to talk more about it as, as we get more information but it turns out that port authorities have a lot of advantages um, 
that can lead to incentives that could help us attract uh, potential companies. Um, the other thing is Greene County does have a port authority. <coughs> so one option is uh, uh, as they're sort of revitalizing uh, their role to possibly collaborate with Warren County that has more background on this. So um, I don't want to go into a lot of detail because again we're still in conversations but I think that's an important update and, uh, and we really thought it was a great meeting exciting okay. that wouldn't necessarily be that wouldn't necessarily be um, instead of designation that would be well nation or uh, could it be that is a yeah that's that's a possibility actually um, okay. that that could be so so again um, Pete Williams was at that meeting and so he's uh, going to be doing some more research with the Greene County Commissioners and we'll have more of an update soon about okay. how that might work okay yeah. so um, I would say coordinate then yeah. be aware as you're thinking about CIC of, of, of maybe including in that scope or thinking about it in relation to the concept of Port Authority yeah All right. Uh, yeah. One, uh, quick or one more thing. Did, Marianne, did you attend that meeting with? No. Yeah. So, so I guess one of the two of us will have to. <coughs> yes. So it's not three. Right. Okay. But if one of you yeah. liaises with with Brian okay. uh, and maybe and maybe also talks to Mr. Russell. Right. Martin Russell. Martin Russell. Um, uh, that because he does seem very knowledgeable and um, you know this is what he does so helping us think through um, w how to think about and this would be just to be clear um, even if there were a referendum and CB doesn't go forward we do have to be thinking about our economic future and um, and and organizing for that so I see this as not about CBE but about economic future and how we're going to be organizing. I think I'm seeing lots yeah. of nods. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, I know there's a, at least one, one question <laughs> out there from Diane Chittister. Diane Chittister, Yellow Springs News. I just wanted to get a little more clarity about the timeline. Um, the three to four months that Jerry referred to, is that the rezoning process, Kent? Uh, he's right. I think on, re on reflection, that's too short a time frame. But no, there's two steps. One is consider what's the most appropriate zoning and get it applied, and then going through the approval process with the plan. So it's two, two processes, and they have to be done in order. They can't go forward in parallel. OK. So, so CB is not going to planning commission soon, no. or in February, at any rate. No. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, Bill, and then. Um, yeah, this is Bill Firestone again, and I would like to talk about the uh, Declaration of Covenants and Restrictions for the Center of Business and Education, which I think is the real problem. Uh-oh, I'm out of time already. <laughs> well, it's the fastest three minutes I've ever been through in my life. I'm so nervous, but anyway, um, I, I think the real problem is not, I'm, I'm really glad you guys are looking into other options. It's good to look at uh, lots of possibilities, but I believe this document is really the problem with this. And what this document does is it protects the interests of um, Education Village, Inc., but it does nothing to protect the interests of the village. And the reason I say that is that the um, Architectural Review Committee, which is one person, may, um, it says from time to time, in its sole discretion, amend and or repeal by simple majority vote, which in this case would be one person, various standards, procedures, rules, and or regulations, which shall be known as architectural guidelines. So essentially they're architectural guidelines, but they can be repealed by this one person at his own or her own discretion. He can adopt, amend, or repeal without consulting any public entity or without any process at all other than this person deciding to change it. Um, and when you get to approval of plans, it says that this one person may waive the requirement for any of the foregoing plans that it deems not applicable. So there are specific requirements laid out, but this one individual is given the uh, power to waive all those requirements at his or her discretion. 
uh, 4.2 the architectural review committee shall in this case one person shall not unreasonably withhold approval of any plans that conform in every way with the architectural guidelines so this per same person has the ability to rigidly enforce the code so that uh, it would drive up the cost of construction and some of the items in the, this code are things like um, plants being three feet up three feet tall already when they're when they're installed and, and like extensive details about landscaping and screening and all kinds of extra things that are uh, included here that, that may or may not be enforced at the sole discretion of this one person and then I flip to the back of the document and so all we're talking about so far is architectural um, codes now we get the variances and we're still talking about air architectural codes the same person the architecture review committee has the right to approve alternates or variations from the guidelines without the necessary of granting a formal vari variance approval of plans and spe specification by the architectural review committee this one person containing <coughs> items that do not conform shall constitute sufficient authority to depart from the guidelines so again this one person has complete authority without consulting any public entity or consulting anybody for that matter okay and here's the real kicker duration and term termination section 12.1 all of the covenants and restrictions shall run with the land and shall be binding but they may all be um, waived by the fi filing of a simple affidavit and that ha actually occurred uh, a couple of weeks ago when a change was made to this document and all that had to be done was go down to the county file an affidavit nobody had to be consulted this, this offers no protection to the village thank you great okay um uh you first and then jerry sorry i'm terrible with names i can't always okay, come up with them choir, so right I'm okay hi Good evening, my name is Hannah Delamater. And um, as the, the body and the true um, spirit of the CB is, is saturating into the public, um, <laughs> some things that have caught my attention are people approaching in conversation saying, is this serious? Are we for real? Aren't we aware that there is tons of space, shovel ready and vacant buildings available directly in our area? Um, that being said, I would like to publicly appeal to CR members and the, the council to consider in the rezoning process setting aside green belt and land for our um, agricultural use to go for that. So, okay, great, thanks. All right, Jerry. Uh, the covenants were cut. I think in 2006, uh, maybe 2004, well before my time, uh, I may not have drafted them the same. I always revert to Law 101 when I talk about covenants. Uh, it was com the complaint was it provided no protection for the village. Covenants are not intended to provide. <coughs> Uh, protection for the village. They provide protection for landowners to which the covenants extend. The village could not enforce the covenants. It would have to be another property owner that said, excuse me, that agreement that we entered into regarding our land, you are violating. I'll give you an example. When uh, the developer of Birch 3 acquired 25 acres, five of which was part of Glen Helen, and Glen Helen uh, Preserve, there was a covenant that ran through to that land to contiguous property owners. They, a lady from Florida, came up to stake her claim and said, you're violating our covenant. Therefore, the developer abandoned that five acres, gave it to Glen Helen Association, and moved his detention pond onto his 20 acres. The village did not come in and enforce it. So it helps to understand when you're talking about a covenant what it is and whose rights it protects. Yeah, and, and the covenant doesn't trump the building code, the zoning code. Not at all. It's a private contract. 
the planning commission yeah. decisions zoning etc yeah. okay um, all right uh, I don't see any we we do have a big budget discussion and this is obviously going to come back before council in other formats and before planning commission so I'm not trying to cut it off too fast but I think we're ready to move on to the next decision I'm going to call for a five minute um, break. we're um, reconvening the meeting um, we're now moving on to budget se session we're going to be revisiting the enterprise fund at the last um, we had our first budget hearing at the last meeting um, at 6 o'clock and unfortunately Melissa wasn't able to be there because of a family emergency so um, council ended up with a lot of questions and we that we weren't really able to address so um, and when we saw what was on the agenda for this meeting we knew it was going to be late and it probably made more sense to revisit the enterprise fund get those questions answered before we moved on to the general fund so um, Melissa is here and I think things are going better for her so yes um, for her family and uh, just turn it over to you to start to talk about the enterprise funds okay um, basically basically what I did was um, I did revise what you had in the packet the last time I did take out the 2013 budget um, I had included that because um, some of the past presentations that I had seen it was included um, but it did raise quite a bit of questions um, because of some of the figures I guess um, didn't seem very familiar um, so I did I did remove that um, if there are questions I'm, I'm ready to um, answer those um, regarding uh, the last presentation that you all received in the packet so I did revise this slightly. Um, I had started to dig into the electric fund a little bit more in terms of what had happened um, with usage and um, consumer fees and then also um, the correlating expenditures. And so I, I did revise some of the electric fund figures um, to take a more conservative approach. But this, this top page, if you take a look at that, I tried to give a snapshot of what had happened um, the last two years and then again what I am proposing and then the pages that follow just give a little bit more detail. Basically three out of the four funds have um, seen declining revenues and expenditures that are, that are only increasing or remaining a bit flat. The salt, with the exception of the solid waste fund where the revenues have remained kind of flat there um, but the, the expenditures are continuing to increase. So three out of the four funds are seeing declining revenues and expenditures are, are continuing to either stay flat or, or rise. So just on that cover page with that snapshot, I guess, does anybody have any questions with kind of what is going on overall in general? So if, if, I, w if, if I were to look in, at electric, uh, so it looks like for the last two years, uh, expenses have exceeded revenue. Yes. And, and, and then in uh, for 14, what we're, we're, we want to try to reverse that. From yes. The it, I was trying to take a more conservative um, approach. I did, I did keep the revenues at a, at a lower rate, kind of in line with 2013, but the expenditures were decreased a little bit because when the revenues, we weren't, we weren't putting out as much kilowatt hours, um, so that obviously we've seen that in our revenues but also in our expenditures our power costs are decreased too okay. so I did take a more conservative approach with what our power cost might be next year as well so they kind of go hand in hand the revenues and the expenditures with the kilowatt hours is it possible that some of the deficits in the last two years <coughs> were due to us buying the Bryan Center debt is that a piece of that if you look at actually if you flip over to the next page where we look at the electric fund um, I know that the transfers were a, a big issue in the last meeting that weren't really outlined very well. Um, in 2013, there was $583,000 that went out in transfers, and of that, 455000 was the Bryan Center bond. Right. So that was... Um, so it wasn't an expenditure, it was an investment. Yes. I mean, we have an asset. Right. Yes, we bought, that was where the Bryan Center bonds were per paid off. And then... Um, there's about 130, 140,000 each year that is a transfer um, for the kilowatt hour tax payment that goes out to the general fund. So that's the other transfer. But the the large, 
that that number was so large because there was a four hundred fifty five thousand uh, dollar Bryan Center bond payment. Um, on the I'm sorry. On, on the cost of um, the electric rate isn't the rate that we charge our customer it doesn't it fluctuate depending upon the cost of the electric yes. that we're buying so so our rate where with the water rates or the sewer rates we have a flat fee that always gets paid with electric it varies depending upon the cost of the electricity yeah right? there's a lot that's involved in that there's a whole other company that that figures and calculates monthly how that rate works and I still don't have a really good handle on exactly how that works but it does it fluctuates I, I used to do that um, for uh, us huh? yeah for the village when wow I before. Yeah. oh my god well but yeah no, I, <laughs> I wrote a whole new electric rate structure in the mid 80s and I'm not sure we're not still using <laughs> the same <laughs> same rates but but we worked in a wholesale power cost adjustment so that as rates as what we pay fluctuate we simply pass through those changes to the residents. Mm -hmm. And I re do you remember Carl Spear? In fact, I think he just passed away recently. Did he? I thought yeah, I saw. No, a, he's, he was my neighbor for years. Yes, I thought I saw a note. I thought I saw his name in the obits last week. Okay. Okay, but it may that may have been somebody different. Okay. But I remember the first time we had a negative wholesale power cost adjustment. Carl was the only person in town and went through and actually figured his bill every month to see if we were doing it right and he mm. called me all alarmed that we had it we had a negative wholesale power cost adjustment and we were going to bankrupt the village um so, sorry. i mean it should be i i think hopefully it's clear to citizens that part of the reason we were able to make that big transfer is because there's a very there's a there's a significant comfortable budget um, carryover surplus it's not reflected here right now and um, that is one thing that I'm hoping within the next couple of weeks I'll be able to come back to council once all the reconciliations are done I think everybody knows that um, the accountants had yes. had um, the reconciliations and we're supposed to meet with them on Wednesday so I'm hoping that we'll be able to get all of those fund balances um, as accurate as possible so I can come back and say last year this is what happened and this is how it affected our fund balances so I'm hoping to be able to get a better report as to where those fund balances are once those reconciliations are complete and we bought street lamps for um, Dayton Street the street lamps in front of the winds that's a hundred thousand dollars so that's another part of that yes de deficit so when I look at these red numbers on the electrical fund I'm not as concerned because I know that the deficit a big most of that deficit is strategic investments that we made because of the presence of a, of a significant surplus um, where it was a legitimate expense to spend it out of this a capital expense yes, but correct. we don't we <coughs> for for 14 right now for uh, capital on the second page is zero yes uh, so just because we haven't at, so council hasn't allocated anything um, in terms of improvements um, we <coughs> I'd submitted that the list of the the wish list of capital projects so yeah we didn't have anything allocated in there until but, the decision was but made. what you know but it will in turn become actuals yes and it you know is our plan and, and I'm not looking for an answer now but you know as we we look at capital it was is our plan to to not go deficit um, I think it depends I think it, it depends on what we. I, I want to see those fund balances. Yes. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. that's that's, that's the me piece that's a big that piece. Without that, I can't answer. Yeah. See, because because I you know I don't know if if in the past we did that. You know, because you because you would you'd, you'd like to come out at the end with you know you, when you put your budget together it's balanced. And you, and you don't have deficits. I'm just right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, right. I mean, I don't. Unless just, deficit I'm just spending is not good. It's not <laughs> unless you have. You need to do capital investment, right? To defer important capital investment because you don't want to go into when you've <coughs> built a surplus. That also could be mm -hmm. damaging. I mean, that line that Mark Roosevelt said, right? The deferred right. maintenance yeah. is the. Uh, is a sign of a declining civilization. We we defer a lot of capital investments that we really need to need to make, 
and uh, this is one of the areas where we can do it. And if it, you get some red numbers, that can look scary if you don't know that. I mean, last 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 time I remember the number, it was around two million. Sure. Uh, it's let, let me. Exp I'd like to see the, the beginning balances too, because the one that I'm worried about here is the sewer fund. It shows that we're doing deficits, but it doesn't say what those deficits are coming out of. What was the starting balance? Right. When when you do any kind of a utility, generally you, you set a rate that produces your income, and that's pretty static. It doesn't change much over time. And as your rates slowly, as your costs slowly increase, they match or meet the income level, and but you've built up a, a cushion over those years. There have been several years where you've brought in more than you spent. And when you cross over into deficit spending, usually you continue to go in that direction for two or three or four or five, five years until you draw the balance down again, and then you set a new rate that's higher, and you, you know, it's, it's just a, con it's a ratchet. Right. Okay? Right. So deficit spending, unless you're going to change rates on a yearly basis, it's all, it's, it's, it's not inappropriate. Well, and to Lori's point, I mean, if it, it could be that the carryover is too high with with the electric fund, right? Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, and we talked about that as a possible ameliorating factor for right. water rates. Yeah, um, I have a question regarding the uh, decrease in revenue, mm -hmm. and I notice on the second page say there is an 18 percent decrease uh, this is the for the electric fund it's actually nine percent that was a that was a typo that I noticed so yeah oh, that's actually nine a, a nine percent decrease and of that um, this is interesting um, one of the staff um, had actually pulled like the top 50 users of our electricity and there was a two hundred and twenty one thousand dollar decrease from 12 to 13 what was billed out it's not necessarily what we collected but it was a decrease of two hundred twenty one thousand so that deficit <coughs> that we see was the majority of it was within the top 50 power users that we have in the village and do you have any idea of what is that a result are those top 50 businesses yes most the majority of them yes if not all of them are businesses so does that People, mean that some of those businesses have left do you know or um yeah um creative memories was listed in there okay. they were they were much higher on the list and then they they bumped down pretty far between because uh, i've got she she ran the ones for january of 12 to january of 13 and then january of 13 to january of 14 so the majority of the decrease um w of what we build out was top 50 users and yes these are all these are all businesses and organizations. So I, right. I guess the point that but the I other so the other issue that plays into that is that we have been encouraging people with you and know, incentivizing to use less, to use less energy. Well, yeah, and, we, and, 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 and our college has been going through these. They they have they have solar panels now. Mm -hmm. They have geothermal. They have been working with AMP and with um, Ener Efficiency Smart on energy savings Tom went through it he's I'm Tom's easily one of our top 50 users he <coughs> went through a huge <coughs> energy um, rehab with mm -hmm. his new lights so oh, Tom's market yeah Tom so so yeah there it, it's a good thing that is a good thing right. we're not buying it so we're not paying for it yeah. so it's not you know it's one of those things there still is that carryover cost there is the, there is the there is the percentage that we put on there to pay for the system that we're not getting so that will end up hurting us a little bit I mean it will end up having declining revenues for us to operate the system but not to buy power okay. yeah. we pay a membership fee to be part of amps efficiency smart program that Karen mentioned and they actually come and work with our customers to help them decrease their usage <coughs> Maybe we're shooting ourselves in the foot. No, I mean, we're just... <laughs> yeah. No, well, partly really we had to do that because yeah. it was part of our Gorsuch agreement. We were invested yeah. for 50 years in a very polluting coal plant yeah. that when the EPA shut that down, we had no choice but to... Uh, there was a... I believe it was the same program that we, we had to... Isn't that mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it was three to. years. We did it for three years. Well, we didn't have to. We could have just paid it. That's true. We yeah. could have paid it, but it was, <laughs> yeah. a, it was, a, it was a, a way of dealing with that. Right. It's fine. It's so so does that it. mean that as businesses and residents increase their energy efficiency, that creates a financial problem for the 
village government? It can. In the, in the long run, it can, yeah, uh, because there's another piece of it, which is the, the infrastructure we own and the crews that we pay to maintain it and the billing system and all of that, there's a certain amount of overhead that, yeah, the, the fewer kilowatt hours you have to spread those costs right. over. So would, do you think that there's sort of a critical mass that if we reach that in terms of you in terms of the amount of usage which also impacts the number of users that above that critical mass we're okay and then if we start following below that because of the overhead costs let's say and the carrying costs that then that makes it more difficult Is that we're so small yeah I mean for example we have four people that do all the water and electric distribution work can we really lay off one of those four when because our demand is declining? Probably no, I wasn't not. Talking about trying to lay off, but, but no, well, but that's the whole that's, that's the cost it, of that's operations. Cost of that's that. what you're that's talking what about. That's what it is. No, I, I was talking more about increasing the number of users. I mean, right, exactly, oh, right. and that's where our bigger problem is that we've got contracts to purchase a certain amount of electricity right. from AMP and I mean, we, that we are going to pay for whether we use that amount of, elect of electricity or not. So we absolutely need more users. Right. Or, or we talk to AMP and see if we can find somebody to buy us out of a contract. Some of our contracts might be appealing to other people. Yeah. So yeah. When, when, when Vernay was here, they alone accounted for something like 30% of all the utility usage in the village. So they're gone. So that means, uh, well, and th for the water system, for example, if with our industry and the college and all the other users gone away or reduced in scale, the rates have got to go up twice as much because half the customers are gone, half the cu half the volume is gone. It is something for the energy energy board as 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 in the past talked about the fact that because so much of our energy by 2015, 85 percent of our electricity is renewable sources, um, encouraging people to consider electrical heating systems, to consider as a, as a greener in some ways than some of the other potential options um, like uh, that, that you can use because most of it's coming from hydro and from wind and from landfill gas. It's where your electricity is coming from. It, and it's also why um, our, our consultant and, and Laura were opposed to net metering because net metering is their proposal was that we retain a small portion of the rate so to pay for the overhead with net metering people that have solar are getting back exactly what they pay in so we're not retaining anything to cover the overhead of our electric system yeah that's a problem yeah just to put things in context, in the mid-60s, a, a private think tank called the Committee for Economic Development asked the question, what's the smallest economically efficient size for a municipal government? And the answer 40 or 50 years ago was a city of about 50,000 was the smallest size that could be efficient. So anytime you talk about a village of 3,500, we have huge, what I call diseconomies of scale. anything anything yeah I mean obviously I think I would like us to have a water rate increase um, that can be implemented by like April 1st yeah we need to yeah we know it's going to have to go so up let's do something instead I think just do some some percentage to help cover this is very scary to me and we need to cover that uh, immediately so if we can e even if we, we will probably need to do yet another one, but we need to get something in place fast. Okay. I will. But to me, I mean, the sewer's looking, the sewer's in a worse shape than the water. Well, it's, but it started with a higher balance. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. And part of the sewer fund that was driving that um, larger um, overage is the VAC truck lease. That's a $50,000 a year expense that's included in there okay. but we also did a three million dollar rehab of the wastewater treatment plant yes. without a rate increase mm -hmm. and that's yes. 
not we have <laughs> that's to, not very practical yeah. we have to do it's a not very realistic reading piece there too Melissa can you explain on the sewer fund um, the note about um, the assistant village manager being figured in? oh um, what I had done was um, just because the personnel costs were slightly higher in there the way that um, the salaries and benefits are structured um, I I had talked with everyone to try to figure out where personnel um, is headed in 2014 so I would know how to distribute wages and benefits and such and um, that assistant village manager position was figured in and the way that there are a few of the positions that are just well actually a lot of the positions are distributed across departments and um, like the village manager the assistant village manager um, the finance director um, the administrative assistant and yeah that's those are those are the big one or those are the only ones are distributed between administration electric water distribution and sewer collection so those are parted out so there was an additional position that um, was a part of the driver of the personnel costs that were in that fund so I did include that in there okay. So yeah, a lot of these, um, uh, almost everyone's salaries and benefits are distributed among different departments. It's, mm -hmm. it's rare to see, except for the police department. That's the only one where police department comes out of police department and nowhere else. But Everyone else is kind of parted out. But that 210 is not all assisted. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, it was, it was, par it was part of, it, it was uh, just a partial uh, yeah, driver. I mean, there were, yeah. yes, yeah. there were, uh, yeah. yes. It's okay. part of the reason it's higher than last year. Okay. Yes. So okay. it's, it's in <laughs> other, it's in other funds. Is. This is, you just yeah. wanted to highlight yes. it there. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. okay. right. Um, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, what, what? I was I, just going to ask the contractual services in sewer, um, sewer collection and treatment well mostly sewer collection I guess um, increased from last year to this year there's two categories um, well, sewer see. collection and treatment yeah went from 150 to one almost 200 and then from 62 to almost 90 and this one was in sewer in sewer. oh contractual services yeah okay I am looking at six six twenty sewer reef. I know my mine is like seventeen pages oh. long, so it takes me longer. But, to but get in uh, two thousand and twelve, it was one hundred and twelve thousand. Yeah, why that, does that vary so much? Jumped, then it went down, and then let's see. Professional services in twenty twelve in that line was seventy five thousand, and last year it was only thirty two thousand. The original budget was fifty thousand, so I stuck with that for 2014's projections, um, kind of cut, splitting the difference. Um, so the professional services was the main driver behind that contractual services line. Okay. So that would Joe be Bates may be able to explain right why why it's fluctuated so much. Maybe you can, Kent. I do. I'm too new to know what right. happened two years ago. I think I, I suspect Joe Bates might might know. Well, sewer collection would be Jason Hamby. Oh, sorry. And uh, right, yeah, Joe, Joe could help us with gen with uh, <coughs> contractual services in uh, treatment. Yes, right. Because um, that also because that went up another forty thousand. Right. Why? Uh, uh, I think that my guess <coughs> is that has to do with sludge management. We've been having trouble. Yes, that's right. With uh, with the sludge management. Uh, applying had sludge a to land. On so, that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. that would be. I don't. In sewer collection, the only thing could be professional services would be engineering would be the only thing I could think of. Huh. Okay. Yeah. What? Um, I'm. No, that's a separate line. Yeah, that that shows up in here, but it's a separate line. That separate is, line. Uh, yeah, that's a separate right. line. That's under capital. Joe is here. Well, he. Oh, he well, is. I'm sorry. Yeah, Joe can't. <laughs> oh, is he back there? Yes, oh, he sorry. Is. But, but sewer collection is not, not. Is not Joe. Is okay, it? well, come on up. Sewer yeah, treatment Jason. is a pretty big jump, too. Do you know, Joe? Uh, you've got the uh, lab, contractual uh, service with lab. You have uh, five solids removal with Cinegro. Yeah. Um, there's some legal uh, 
that's taken out of that too, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Occasionally, yeah. But yeah, the, the jump from 2013 to 2014 is like from 148 to 191. Over. Most, most of that, um, I sat down with all of the supervisors, and most of that is because the 2014 budget, we tried to keep the same as 2013 to kind of add a, as a buffer. So the actuals are a little bit less than what was actually budgeted. And some of those figures we left at what was budgeted in 2013 to serve as a buffer because we weren't really sure if we were going to need it or not. So okay. like well, if, okay. it, if only 33 was spent last year, 33000 but we had a $50,000 budget after we sat down and talked about it, he said maybe we should leave it at 50000 because I see this or that possibly okay. coming. So that's, that's kind of what we did. That's an easy explanation. And that okay. was part of why I had that 2013 budget in there, so that if it went from 33 was actually spent, but you've seen that a $50,000 budget yeah, was there. I like having the budget there. It's just that was not the budget we approved, <laughs> Yeah. so Do far as I can tell. Was there anything about that you were going to um, say? Yeah, what I did was, um, because the, I know that the electric revenues were really wildly off from what everybody had recalled and what I had done was I had um, dug back into the computer system because what I did how I created all of this was I did the revenue and the expense reports for 2013 and I went by what the budget what was budgeted and then what actually happened and it looked I, the only thing that I was able to find I wasn't able to f uh, find any supporting documentation but I did find where it was the end of July there it is um, July 26th, there were probably 20 or 30 um, different changes to the budget. So I found where the budget expected revenue was modified to reflect the figure that I had included in the, the starting budget of 2013. And it just, the description said annual estimated receipts. So I couldn't find any more other than I found the transaction where it happened, but I couldn't find any supporting documentation to kind of back it up as to why it happened. So I did do some digging. I found where it was changed, but I can't tell you why it was changed just because it was, it was before me. But I guess when I thought of projected budget, you wouldn't mm -hmm. be looking at anything <coughs> in July. You'd be looking at what did we approve that year? We approved the budget in November or December. Well, so I mean, be, to different. Me, that's the projected budget. It's what did, what did we say we were going to spend? What did we actually spend? And and so that was that was my confusion. I guess that what I was going by was any changes that occurred within the year to br to bring us to where where we ended up and not where we started. I guess so. It I guess it's just kind of two different schools of thought some different changes I mean because you never know what's going to happen during the year and the changes that occur so I wanted to show kind of the final version of the budget right after all the changes that would have occurred and I guess that it it was very wildly different at least with right. that whole electric revenue then it's thing. not projected anymore then it but it was a revised budget is what she said yeah yeah, yeah year but revised budget. but no there were two columns there's the what did we actually spend and mm -hmm. the projected budget you yes project the budget in at the beginning and then you see where you ended up right mm -hmm. projected is this is what you actually approved mm -hmm. way back when and then here's how it turned out but I, th I think what I'm hearing Melissa say, saying that, that as you looked at it, you made the assumption that we had revised the budget yes. and increased increased it. Yes. But yeah. what, what, what we're saying, and I hear what Lori's saying is, you know, we approved it in November. It was never brought back to us to make any adjustments and we well, we and know we do. We do a periodic yeah. adjustments, but I guess I think of I, not to I, the budget. I, not to the not budget, to though. The <laughs> yeah, budget. yeah. That's right. and, and that's what yeah. Melissa's Power saying is she she saw changes to the yeah. to the budget, so she used the assumption that we in, had increased the budgets, and this is what the bottom line was. And, and also, didn't you say that we went to a new system? Correct. In May, there was a new system change over. So. It's hard telling what could have transposed in that switch over. I don't know, so mm -hmm. okay. it's it's hard telling. I mean, right. when they when they inputted the budget in May, that's some that's things could have. What's changed. most important is what did we actually spend? Yes, yes, in the end. yes. that's what's yes. important. Yes, uh, on the solid waste fund, um, <coughs> is there a reason the contractual services? Do we have a 
have they, they submitted a... Do we have a new contract? Yes. Um, and see, yeah. part of that was kind of confusing because the actuals, um, part of that payment was paid in 2014 because Jason's figures for the solid waste fund to Rumpke are um, contractual services were actually 257000 and some some weird things happened there there was a blanket PO some of the money was taken away and I guess he had to come back to council to ask for more because part of the blanket PO was taken away there was a lot of really weird things that happened with that um, but 257 was what was actually spent and I believe that some of that was applied into 2014 because of the final billing so the 218,000 in contractual services wasn't all inclusive of what happened in the entire year because I believe that some of it was paid into in 2014 so that's why that's so much higher in 2014 mm -hmm. is because yes I was going off of what was spent in 2013 and then trying to be conservative in terms of expenditures and anticipating that there might be a possible increase with Rumpke after talking to Jason that was what we kind of kind of came we had to a three year contract mm -hmm. We? Well, and there's also there's also some other uh, charges in there in terms of like street fair trash collection, um, what the village pays for its own trash collection. Not all of it is passed on to the consumer. So there's a couple of different companies. There's waste. There's it's not only Rumpke. There's also waste management charges, and then there's a, a company called Kim and Tim, I believe. So there are a couple of other charges that come out of the the waste, the solid waste fund too. So. There a guy and a couple of people in a truck. <laughs> his kid <Yeah>. and Tim. <laughs> so that and means. There, oh, go ahead. Oh, well, then, uh, why is the charges for services going down? You've got it going going down by. I mean, not much, but. I was just trying to take a conservative approach, just because. I was just being more right. conservative with that figure. So. Something we're, mm -hmm. some we're lost. Yes. Something. Okay. So essentially, we broke even in 2013. I mean, because if we're talking about two fifty-seven, so that's what thirty-seven thousand. So it's yeah, but part of that, part of those rumpy charges came in late right. and got paid in fourteen and getting didn't get applied to twenty thirteen. So it 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 was it was probably yeah, just about even. Okay. Well, actually, no, it would have been in the red because if we took in two hundred and fifty-one thousand. I know based on the charges that Jason had provided me that it was 257,000 was the Rumpke charges alone. So pretty or close. 5,000. Yeah. <coughs> um, and there's not much in that that budget and I mean you wouldn't yeah. not a it's not a budget that has any capital expenses. So you don't want a lot of money in that budget, but mm -hmm. th there's not much more than $26,000 in that budget, so I would say we would want to uh, be uh, we we want to examine our rates. I think solid waste is definitely one of the most cut and dry because you've got consumer fees and then you've got the contractual services. It's basically two lines, and that's right. it to that budget. So, so yeah, if we can have some advice on, on that, that would be good. So are we um, the. I don't know if anybody, if everybody noticed the calendar. I asked Judy to put a calendar in mm -hmm. um, the packet. Where, whereabouts um, is that? Huh? Is, is right, at the, is? right at the end. Oh, at the very end. Yeah. Oh, okay. And to to make sure to see if we want, since we kind of missed a, a budget session, okay, um, if we're going to have time with the schedules, the schedule that we have. So next week, we've got the 18th. 6 p.m. starts we've got an hour will you be ready with the general fund I should be I just have a few loose ends to tie up with that and I should be good to go okay so we can do general fund no, it's turned sideways. That's why I can't on the 18th then we've got we've got the special council meeting on the 24th um, 6 p.m. well we we had done a 7 p.m. start. Something I had talked to Judy about was maybe we should do a 6 p.m. start on the 24th. On the 24th, because to make up for kind of the the missed meeting, the, the um, but that would be <coughs> because we need to do we still need to do capital. Mm -hmm. We need to revisit capital. And speaking of the capital, are you are you going to be able to do a five year rather than you know kind of 
space it out over five years, work with the guys and figure out what their yeah, schedule is. Yeah, I can do that. I can definitely go back and, and do some revisions to that. Okay. That is, is five year better or three? Which is, which gives us a better? I guess it depends on the projects and I, right, okay. I'm going to have to talk it over with them. I don't want to, I don't want to say three year would be better than five and okay. then I meet with them and based on the projects, I okay. think that I'll, I'll meet with them. So we have had a five year. We we've always five done five, yeah. In the past. So, so there should be those in the files. Yeah, so the, so the 24th would be, and I've got some documents here I was going to give you from past budget sessions. Okay. Um, so we'd be doing capital, and then the intent then was to, to kind of just revisit the other two funds, that were the, the enterprise and general fund. Mm -hmm. um, and it's possible we can get that done in two hours. Um, well, I think starting early makes sense. And then we can just, you know, get out as early. And then, so then we have on the 3rd, of March we have the first reading and on the uh, 18th of why do we have the 18th it's not I don't think the 17th is a no. I don't think that I don't think st. Patrick's Day is a uh, a so. national holiday <laughs> <laughs> we might like a day off, but I don't think it's a national holiday <laughs> So does, does, do we see? Do we do we all think we're okay? Do you think we should consider adding another budget session, or do you think we're okay? I don't know. I'd like St. Patrick's to be a national holiday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. Too bad, McQueen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can always if when we get after maybe after the 18th. I mean, that's going to be the big one to see the see how the general fund goes. Um, maybe and if, if we, we need and one. then if we need a Saturday, yeah. I mm -hmm. hate them, but you know, yeah. we've done it before. Yeah, so it open, but yeah. okay. And I'm hoping to have all of the fund balances and such together before capital is talked about because that's going to be really important. Yeah, absolutely, and right. making that the determinations as really to what helpful. happens with capital. So right. I'm really anxious for Wednesday to come and go so I can get started. So okay. Great. I'll try. It. That's my goal. Okay. 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 Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thank Melissa. You. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the values, goals and values discussion or goals discussion. Um, what I said I was going to do at the last meeting and what I did is I took, um, I took the documents and, and anything I received from all of you and color coded it. And so basically this document now I changed the word, I added, um, uh, the, what was it, Dirk, who was here, and he suggested adding the vision statement, which I thought was a good idea. So I added the vision statement to the beginning, changed principle to value. We can change it back if we would prefer, but we kept all those the same. And then under that, um, if, it's, if it's in bold, those were things that were on more than one list. And Lori is purple, oh. and Mary Ann is green. I knew she would want green, and Brian is blue. So um, the color, the, the strategy Brian has purple on, and Brian has blue. I know, color. wow, I knew. Um, wow. So, so anything that's in a color is a new, um, is, is a new goal that was added. Um, and, um, you know, Lori had a couple of comments. I mean, you might, might want to say, say say what your comments were about the goals in general Lori <laughs> I said we have we're gonna have a new village manager we've got a brand new finance director we are gonna have a assistant manager we have a new utilities new person new people in utilities so um, that's a lot of new staff who need time to get their feet on the ground and I'm worried that we if we overburden them while they're still trying to get their feet on the ground we might shoot ourselves in the foot and make their lives miserable so I would like us to be really thinking about um, especially in those first six months so like the next uh, especially once we hit uh, June and we have the new manager coming on that we be really cognizant of maybe not right now do this a little bit later um so uh so that was my my one of my main things and then was to be sure we get um 
we do what we said we were going to do in our retreat and make sure all of those things don't just go off into the ether mm -hmm. um, and not try to add too much <coughs> new um, especially anything new that will demand a lot of time or attention and it's easy to underestimate how much time and attention something that we're proposing can take from staff that really has to do a lot of groundwork just to understand where we are. Mm -hmm. That was my, my caution. Good. I guess I'll just say personally for the goals that I added, um, they were tied to uh, commissions. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I mean, I agree with Lori that that doesn't mean they won't take any of, you know, village staff time, but, you know, that's one thing I was thinking about is that, you know, that's commissions doing a lot of that work. And I did feel that, uh, that that actually a few of these things can be through maybe through 20, 2014 can be handled by council a little bit and commissions before to work out some things before it goes on to um, back to staff. But um, you know I don't know I mean we we're nearing 10 o'clock so I don't um, have the energy to be spending a lot more time on this. I know you know this is um. Um, well, <coughs> I have some thoughts. Okay. First of all, uh, I, I, don't, I don't see a purpose in just sort of putting out goals and then not really doing much about it. Well, I agree. Um, and I also uh, am concerned, I guess, sort of like what, or, uh, if you put a lot of stuff down there and then are you, are you really going to be able to do it? But um, I mean, I have a fair amount of experience in working with goals and in doing like Dirk did this sheet where you do all the things that he put down and then you put, you know, you do all this kind of stuff and then quarterly you go through it. And, and there's a value in that. And, and I would also be willing to, to sort of work on some kind of structure for that. But to start with, it seems to me that in terms of our goals we'd look at what the goals were last year mm -hmm. and review them I mean did they happen didn't they happen that what was a document that was in our packet have when we, we started this did, discussion did we review them though to talk about did, did we review them and I'm just it, it, was, it was in out our on last that. packet um, and and also, the way that we, I, I think it would be good, not this year, but uh, next year, to think about the process that we use to decide the goals. I mean, it seems like it could be a little more strategic than all of us sort of putting in what we'd like to do. I mean, mm -hmm. it needs to be based on, uh, I guess we need to be able to at least base our goal decisions on some kind of criteria. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, but the other thing is then if we're going to have any of these goals it, I think it does make sense to put it in some kind of form like Dirk did to say we anticipate doing this step in this period of time and this step in this period of time and this is the person who's going to take leadership in doing it. Uh -huh. um, who's Dirk? Dirk is a new village resident who submitted this. He spoke at our last meeting, uh, and he recommended changing goals to values. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. And he has some uh, he uh, submitted half expertise. most of the paperwork. <coughs> well, yeah. and, and I actually consolidated his that oh, we actually had yeah, duplicate. Somehow it got oh. in here I, twice. I think well, because Judy put in his, but I had also consolidated his. Oh, to okay. Three, to I four pages. It confusing to look yeah. at. Yeah. Like oh my gosh. I wasn't this clear to like Judy that I was taking care of all of Dirk's stuff too. Yeah, I wasn't quite sure. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. I was just... Well, related to what Marianne was saying about, you know, sort of timeline, um, I think this segues into what Judy and I are working on, uh, you know, with the, the calendar and, you know, whether we use Google Docs or something like that. So, I mean, I think some of that should be able to work into, you know, that overall calendar of tracking things. Um, so, I mean, I think we'll play around with that a little bit at least yeah I, I want to support Marianne in saying I don't think we've ever done goals very well and it may be that we need somebody to help us with that um, and this year I think in particular it feels like with the budget coming so late um, 
and uh, two new council members it's it feels especially just kind of higgledy piggledy ideally you're doing goals before you do the budget um, and it's hard to do that when you have two new council people coming on in November who are getting their feet on the ground in December and so I think it has been especially not as coherent a process this year as it probably should be ideally um, and and so I would value figuring figuring it out and maybe maybe this is a good way this looks like oh I don't want to do that <laughs> thing well but if people feel like we can make that work um, I I'm willing to learn it learn from it yeah and I, I I agree with Brian I thought that this calendar whatever calendar system and maybe what you're working on could fit onto something mm -hmm. like this too um, and and you know that's I asked Judy to look at it so maybe you guys can look at it together I mean we really are so restricted this year by things we absolutely have to get done I mean we have to hire a manager and and um, big. and and you know we've all we've just made the commitment on the water plant so so our we are we are very um, we are very restricted for what we're going to get done this year. I think we have to be realistic, and I agree to put too much on this is is we're just going to be disappointed. Um, but I do think some of the things you know you mentioned sidewalks. I think some of those things at the um, at the meeting where we talk about capital projects, we can we can see what Jason has planned for sidewalks. Talk then about I know sidewalks are a goal. We may not. Um, and he had he had a pretty big number in there I think for sidewalks so we'll we'll see what his what his plans are and you know money is how we get to our goals most of the time so um, I, I don't want to just sort of set this aside and I w would also be willing to spend some time like uh, I, I don't know like looking at so, some of these things we know are are we are going to do some of the things maybe are more out there maybe looking at this and deciding what are the things are are most important and what are the things we're going to be setting back although right and although what we also decided in the past we actually started to put things on here like hiring a village manager because we also realized that we had that our goals didn't include the stuff we knew we had to do half the time so you know it was all about it was all about wish lists and not enough about the reality of what we had to do you know things like the wellhead you know we know we're going to do we're committing to a water source the wellhead protection plan we don't need to do that this year it's we're not going to get to we're not going to get to that point in 2013 in 2014 that can be a 2015 project I mean, we're not going to get a new water plant or a rehab done in 2014 where it's the engineering drawings everything it's you know so so we're looking at that in 2015 so it's on this but you know you know that's the thing you can start to do maybe start to put dates you know if we, and start to put well maybe I could get together with you and go yeah, and look at this in way. terms of timeline because you probably have a better sense of yeah well and 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 I think um, um, and, and we also know who's you know a couple of these are Brian's you know people the council members for whom these are important obviously are probably going to take leadership on those and are going to be working on those so looking yeah. at the ones that you had for me I don't can, remember can I ask saying a quick question? those so <laughs> well but the reason this is what I did I took mm -hmm. I took the the, the go council things from the minutes of oh and I so and I articulated them <laughs> out into a council goal okay <laughs> since I said make sure we do the stuff yes said at the retreat <laughs> anything said at the retreat got for me okay yeah, nice <laughs> and unfortunately I missed the last meeting but the the greens and blues were were things that came out of the um, no it was when well in the last meeting we were asked to by Tuesday or Thursday mm -hmm. send to um, Karen our goals and all I said was well let's try not to have too many extra things because we got all this new staff and make sure that we okay so so this was an exercise that okay okay because yeah. you know I'm, I'm, I'm you know I'm, 
and I didn't realize what I was looking at. But uh, <clears throat> we're, we're getting in beginning February mm -hmm. with the things that we have to do, and you know, uh, we only meet twice a month, and you know just carry over from last year that we didn't get done and the discussions this year and then I see a lot of these new things I, I you know yeah I, I think we you know we need them to to, to make a, a commit or a prioritize and say this is what we're going to these are the goals we're going to work on for this year because you know to, to say well let's say Marianne work on some let's say Brian work on some and then they're feeding it to us and they, you know I I, uh, I know I, I, know. You know. I mean cause well, I really I think realistically we are we are going to hire a village manager yeah, I mean, we, we are going to get this water well, sourcing you know, decision and made and moving along and we're going, I mean, those, we're going to figure out the CBE that's going to, and, and then there's going to be these emergencies that arise yeah. that we yeah. have to pay attention to because something like, you know, anything like the pool thing that happened this summer and suddenly we have a whole bunch of meetings mm -hmm. that are sucked into this thing that we can't foresee because we're human beings and life happens. Mm -hmm. Well, um, See, and I just use one example, you know, meeting with uh, the township <laughs> and, and school board. And we've said that since I was elected to council, and well, it, it hasn't happened, but we're adding, <laughs> I know. adding more, and, 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 and that is important, you know, to, to have those, you know. I just throw that out. I, it, it's getting late. Maybe I'm tired, but I, you know, I, I just, <laughs> you know. I look at that and I said it's 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 well some some of these things are I don't think even need to be in terms of goals some of them are things we're just going to do and we can put in the calendar and that's it or, or we know we're going to do it like a retreat we don't need to put it in goals we just put it on the calendar for right November of next exactly. year and that's it and some of the other things maybe we need to say okay w this year all we're going to do is sort of think about them and maybe plan and look to 2015 or 16 and maybe some yeah, of the things we're just going to put it that way i can i, yeah. I can go along well that's with why it, i think so, maybe you know. what would be good yeah. for so, karen yeah. i think karen and marianne yeah. to talk about yeah. that. Yeah, i think that I sounds think good yeah. And, um, okay because yeah i think through that work we're going to see what things are realistic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um, let's move on. Um, Kent. Uh, oh, yes. Yes, oh, I yes. did. Oh. I'm sorry, Chrissy. Thanks, We're Chrissy. just getting tired. I'm tired, too. I get up pretty early. Yeah. Um, so when you're going through your goals and, obje and, and projects that you want to work on, then, for instance, with the sidewalks, how is it decided which of the sidewalks are priority? Because there are a lot of sidewalks in town that I see are in serious need of repair. And I will tell you that the one that I think is most important is Elm Street along the school. I personally have fallen on that sidewalk four times in this year. And one of those times that I slipped on that sidewalk was today. This is one of our most uh, used sidewalks. I live on Phillips Street. I see all the children going to school. They're going up and down that sidewalk. Go take a walk down it today. There are puddles. There's parts of it where you have no choice but to go around the sidewalk. And then that's how I felt today. I slipped in the mud because I had to go around the sidewalk. If I try to walk out in the street, well, there's cars coming up and down the road. And it's just, it's a really bad sidewalk. And I happen to know for a fact it's not part of the safe routes to school thing. That's more about putting in sidewalks that are not there. It's not about repairing sidewalk. And I noticed in our um, draft of your brochure for drawing businesses into the CBE um, that there's quite a paragraph about our lovely maintained sidewalks. One of the first things that people are going to check into when they think about moving to Alice Springs is the school. That's, those sidewalks do not in any way 
set a good image of our village. That's our children, our most precious resource. And I, so I'm wondering, how do, we f how do we know which sidewalks are going to be the priority sidewalks? How do we input into that decision? Because I definitely think that's one of the most important sidewalks if you're going to spend a mm -hmm. bunch of money on sidewalks this year. And actually, I would like to know how soon it can be done because it's in such bad shape. Okay, great. It, I, I want to say that it's, it's very frustrating to me that um, council, the village has only taken on sidewalks for the past two years. That sidewalk did not get in that condition in the past two, two years. years. And so it's frustrating to me that, that it wasn't done by the, they weren't maintained, like many other sidewalks in town, have not been maintained by the property owners. It is our responsibility. It's the, the schools own the property. So, so a lot of property owners have totally neglected their own sidewalks and it's now become our responsibility. Mm -hmm. We aren't going to have the millions of dollars to get those all done immediately. I think we need to hear from Jason. Um, I know Jason, I think, has put He's together plan. some, yeah. some plans for what he wants to do. I talked, I've, I've asked Kent, and I'm not sure Kent knows where to find it. I asked Denise Swinger. There is somewhere a plan about sidewalk, about priorities of what sidewalks need to be done. That was work that was done by, a, um, by our staff in the past so we do have that on on uh, and I think it is disappointing I would have expected those sidewalks to be safe routes to school and I'm they just didn't have enough money they ran out of money um, and that's why they can't be part of that so but that will be that'll be part of our budget discussions that we were just talking about when we do capital projects and that's it's on our calendar um, that's when Jason will be here to talk about the sidewalks and what he's what his plans are for next year so there will be time for public input at that point. Okay. Ken? Just to clarify, oh. You said that it, um, two years ago the responsibility of sidewalks switched from the private property owners to the village? Yes. Okay. I've never heard of that. Yeah. I'm trying. But also I would say that even if, even if it is not the village's fault that the sidewalk is in, in that bad of shape, or why it's in that bad of shape, that's neither here nor there. The fact of the matter is, like I said, we have this brochure saying we have wonderful maintained sidewalks, and so it's we understand. We understand. Right we understand. <laughs> um, Kent, manager's report? I'm going to keep it brief. I. Uh, I handed out a clipping from the Dayton Daily News. I'm one of <laughs> one of two remaining print subscribers. No, because I am too. Well, that's you and me. Then. Okay. Okay. Uh, anyway, it's about uh, uh, the state saying, "Yes, we've taken all your money. Now to make up for that, you guys all get together and figure out how to work together." Uh, I mentioned this is a long-range trend. It's happened in other countries. It happened in this country in the 1950s. We consolidated school districts and all the one-room country schools disappeared. Mm -hmm. um, Yellow Springs was the exception with its Yellow Springs exempted village school district. <laughs> there, could, but, there are uh, a couple more. But it's coming, huh? Yeah, there are a couple more. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, it's a trend that we need to watch out for. Okay. Okay. That's all. Judy? Uh, just a heads up. Lots of meetings coming up, and I'll just let you know we've got um, Planning Commission February 10th, BZA February 12th, Council on the 18th, Council again on the 24th. And the Public Arts Commission starts in on with its first meeting on February 12th. We've got a lot of coming up. Thank you. Um, uh, future agenda items. Um, are we getting this ordinance 2014-3? Is that for the next meeting or is that still being put off? Was Do we the know? The Glen. The easement? It's up to Chris. Okay, then that's a question mark. Um, water sourcing scenarios, you'll have something for the, for the 18th. Yep. Budget workshop, general fund. It says capital. I'm going to take capital out of that. Which I think it's going to be fund. general fund. Don't you think? I think it's yeah. going to be. And then the Melissa, would you agree? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to need time to reconcile everything. Okay. Right. Capital will be probably the 24th. So then the special budget meeting will be capital and just to revisit all funds. Um, then the two readings. Um, I don't know why the loop completion project. Why? Why is that on there for? Because Lori wanted. Lori. Oh. 
I did? Oh, yeah, yes, you did. You did. I, oh, well, I just didn't want to forget it. I don't know that it needs to be. You said it couldn't be done we this year. We won't forget it. When we get our check, we won't forget it. <laughs> I know. But what I what we talked about at the retreat was having long range, having a separate sort of calendar that mm -hmm. has yes, long. We, we're doing that. We will okay. do that. It right, was, and so that's kind of so it can come off of take it off of this. Then is that okay? So then we need the ordinance for water fine. rate increase. Yes, next time. Are we gonna? Are we ready for that? Are you gonna be ready for that? Water and write it quick. No. No. Okay. No. So just that'll be in. Okay. No, we'll, we'll we'll do the that'll supply issue, but the increase can be the next one after that. Okay. 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 Great. Yeah. Okay. Council Thank Chambers you. update. Do you want? Oh, will you? Uh, do? It, we're, we're moving slow on that. Yeah. Okay, so we, we won't worry it, about that. Because it all depends on when Ken can get, Ken can get the gentleman in here to take a look at that. Yeah, I need to draw a direction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify saying aye. 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 <laughs> Melissa.